hanging in the back here using the chat box along side of us and uh i know that uh appreciate your help and uh, let, let's try to make it a little bit more engaging here today um uh what else in the event of any technical difficulties as i see each and every week you know just come back onto the link and uh get back in if we're disconnected at any point in this conversation i'm really excited about today's show uh we've had so many great guests like the two guys that you see on here um in previous shows uh you know uh, richard we it's been a while that we've been trying to get you on we appreciate you taking the time we also appreciate the fact that you're getting up as early as you well as early as you have, I see we're about uh, 12 hours difference there. It's 8 a.m., correct? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's, um, I've been known to get up earlier than this, so don't worry, mate. It's all all good. right. Well, we appreciate <laughs> that. I'll, uh, I'll let Yanni uh, give you a little bit of intro on uh, Richard, and we'll get started with his presentation. Totally. First off, uh, a big thank you to Fab to put this together. And then, as he alluded to earlier, there's there's no real script to today's session, which is the kind of cool piece. And so there's a letting go element from, you know, Fabio, myself, Joey, and of course, Mike in the background and, and without question, Richard, who in my opinion is the coach's coach uh, across the world. He's a huge inspiration of mine. Uh, and I know he's impacted coaches all over the world. And in the, in the few conversations we've had in the last couple of weeks, like we've, we've easily banked over four and a half hours where, one question turns into this cross pollination of what can happen next, which I guess is kind of the theme of, of today, which I'll let uh, Richard maybe introduce a little bit now and, and, and a little bit about himself, because I probably won't be able to do it justice. So without kind of further ado, uh, Richard. Yeah, thanks, Giannis. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I can see a lot of names there. Obviously, can't see you faces, but that doesn't matter. No, no worries. We'll just shoot on. Um, I'm sure if anyone wants to say anything, Mike or somebody will will uh, let the hand go up or uh, speak up. So to make it more interactive. But yeah, pleasure to to be here. Thanks for inviting me, Fabio and and, and Giannis and um, and the rest of the panel, Mike and and Joey. So. Um, yeah, I, I sort of sort of agreed to do it because I think Giannis's uh, tweets and, and our engagement as coaches goes back a, a fair way. And I think that similarity in mindset is something that really is inviting um, to, to do podcasts and stuff like this, that to share that information and, and that experience. And I think the flavor of really the next hour will be sharing information. Um, and it's not necessarily on slides. It's, it's about discussion points, making learning points uh, amongst the group. Um, and, and if you've got anything to share, an idea or anything, and no matter how crazy it is, is, is actually just get it out. Um, and, and the same as your players. Uh, I'm sure that you, you like an environment where your players are sharing stuff with the other players because no matter how crazy it is, um, players learn to listen and learn to take ideas on board together. And no matter how crazy it is, if you feel like you can't share something, then that's not a great environment to be in. So I think as coaches, you need to do that as well. Um, and I think that's just part of being accepted um, and having your own creative individual style as well within the group that becomes part of the group. So that relationship between the individual and the, uh, the, the team or the group is really key. Um, I call it that balance between complementary and like cooperation and competition. So often the players are competing to, to uh, try and get a position in the team and they're competing against the opposition, but they're also cooperating as well. And that balance, like Zen, uh, yin yang is, is, is key. So it's complementary um, in everything that we do and we have to find balances. Um, so as a, as a coaching group, uh, I always, for the last 20 years, work with coaches. What will make you a better coach? Okay, just deciding what's going to make you a better coach. Have you ever thought about what is it that I'm working on right now? What is it that, you know, I don't know? And, and um, have you got people around you that support you and give you information that not always... Um, complements your bias, but actually challenges you a little bit as well. 
So I think that's really key. And that's just sort of setting the, the background really. Um, so I think that's something that, you know, if you, if we splinter off into a chat room, you guys share information, have a bit of a chat. And I, there's a shared document just to start off with. Um, and I think it's been shared in the, um, in, in one of the folders. Yeah, Mike. Yeah. 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 I've just added it to the chat again there. Thanks Richard. Yeah, no worries. So look, that's just a quick one that you guys can can have a bit of a read through um, when you when you get into your little groups, uh, which we're going to try out soon. Um, just read through that scenario and then put yourself in that coach's position. And that's it's a common problem that we have in the Premiership Academies uh, across the UK and actually probably across the world, to be honest. Um, so I'd like you guys just to to discuss that as a bit of a discussion point and then elaborate on that. But what I'll do is I'll just probably share my screen and what I wanna do is, is just chat about a few things that, that are quite important to me at this moment in time. My background, um, just quickly, is um, I was a football player or soccer player and a rugby player. Um, I, was a, what I, was, I was a javelin thrower in 400 meters. Up to a certain age, I did multi-sports. So my background is very much multi-sport. Um, and, and for those of you who know the research, we talk about early diversification, which basically means that you take basic movement skills when you're a young kid and you diversify very quickly. You don't specialize. And when you diversify, it gives you multiple decisions and actions to be able to rely upon when you're um, higher up in performance. And those kids tend to overtake the kids who specialized at an early age who didn't play many other sports. So we know that's around the age of 13, 14. You tend to overtake the other kids. Um, that multi-sport background led me to be able to play a few different sports by the time I was about 18, 19 and choose. Uh, I chose rugby and played Australian uh, schoolboys and then juniors. And then we have a competition called the Super 16s. Back when I was a young kid, I played in the Super 10. So that was a different competition. It was, um, it was uh, you know, going back in time now. Um, but it was the, the competition that really stood out in the world for running rugby. Good decision making, very fast, very intense, a lot of skill, a lot of decision making. And you don't get to see that rugby in uh, UK or America or anywhere else generally. And so they set the new level. And it was pretty much set by New Zealand uh, and Australia because they didn't like each other as countries. So they used to play against each other and that lifted the whole benchmark and South Africa jumped on board and the whole rugby went through the roof and Europe can't catch up with that. And I think what happened was they couldn't catch up because the English invented the game. Uh, and, and the arrogance of, well, we invented the rules, it's our game. Uh, we're going to stick to tradition. I think that culture and tradition holds people back. If you're not prepared to break boundaries and try new stuff and be creative, see you later. Within a couple of years of high sport, you're gone. So, you know, being down in New Zealand was a breath of fresh air and being in Australia, the, the rivalry between the two countries drove new standards. So there you go. You've got cooperation. Australia and New Zealand shared information. They actually, New Zealand copy what Australia do in the World Rugby, and the next year they do it better. So they actually learn together, and we call that um, Darwin's theory of coexisting. So as the coach challenges the player, the player then improves and challenges the coach, and the coach then has to raise the challenge. So you coexist with your players in an in a evolution. And if you're not up to it, and you, you, you don't know where your players are and their capabilities, well, you're not gonna coexist with them very well. You're the one who's gonna be telling them all the time and it's not gonna suit the challenge. So I think that's a key part of sport evolution is, is coexisting with your players. Um, and, and we'll talk a little bit that as we go. So anyway, I, I sort of became a lecturer, did a master's in sports psychology, coaching science degree, and then PhD in skill acquisition. And then I worked at the Australian Institute of Sport. And, and that was good. I worked in two Olympics, uh, London games for the Australian teams, and then um, Beijing. And, and that was fantastic, just working with the different athletes. Uh, and that was across different sports. So individual sports from sailing, 
um, to kayaking, to canoe slalom, to indoor track cycling with anemias. Um, and what I realized, if you work across sport, um, the same principles apply. Actually, they don't differ at all. It's just the fact that there's different ways of moving or there's different decisions you need to make at different times. But the fact is you have to make decisions and the fact is you have to be responsible for your movement and your actions. So these principles of coaching are very, very similar the whole way across sport. Um, I think maybe I started to learn more when I traveled. So as a coach, I think you only really start to learn once you move around and you coach a different team or a different age group, or you go to a different region, wherever you guys are in Canada or the States, if you move around, you may see subtle cultural differences or different ways that people do things. And, but the, the common denominator is football is the game and it's the players and the players needs. But you start to then become a coach that's very sensitive to, oh, wow, this is what they do here. I wouldn't do that normally. But you're not going to tell everyone they're doing it wrong. You, you start to learn from different ways that people do things. And you may add something to your coach, coaching style, or you may sort of say, no, I'm definitely not doing that. You know, I've seen this done too many times and players don't like it. So, um, and, I, and I think that was something, cultural differences in Australia and New Zealand, um, maybe a bit like the States and Canada, fairly new country, like two, 300 years old. Um, there's no script. There was no way of saying, right, this is how we play football. This is how we play rugby. It was an island and people had to cut down the trees and try and live, um, you know, and try and create a new life. And they didn't have a blueprint for the game. They just have this mentality of learning by doing. So let's just play. Um, let's learn and then let's give feedback afterwards. Whereas if you went to England and did a coaching session, they'll talk for half an hour before you do something. Right, this is what we're gonna do, this is how we're gonna do it. Whereas if you're in New Zealand, just play. And what it relies upon is individuals coming together and trying to organize themselves. So we call that self-organizing. So self-organizing is a very big skill down south. It's not very big in the UK because they're Anglo-Saxons. Um, Anglo-Saxons is more about um, huh, Trump, really, domination. It's about what are we going to do? What's our plan? How are we going to master the world? Um, and then it's roles and responsibilities and all that sort of stuff. And we're not saying that's not important. Of course it, uh, of course it is. Um, but when it becomes your overemphasis and you try and have clarity and hang everything based on those plans that that's what can undermine you uh, your level of adaptation disappears your level of your sense of purpose starts to dissolve because it's it's through a hierarchy it's through the coach or it's through the club and then your identity starts to disappear you lose your power and then they start to use words like yeah we need to empower our players we need an identity that's because we took it away in the first place and the big thing about like the All Blacks and uh, Australian rugby when I was there in the early days was that identity took a long time to evolve. And it evolved through the individuals, not through a uh, club identity that was forced upon. And that's been the success of most teams um, coming through is where that I culture um, is not something that you read off a book like the All Blacks, James Care, and say, right, we're going to do these six principles and then we'll have a great culture next year. It, it depends on the players you've got and the environment that you create, and that takes time to nurture. So, yeah, I think that's where Australia, New Zealand, particularly in rugby, was ahead. In football, I worked in football at the Australian Institute of Sport with the Australian 20s, 17s, 16s, and um, they never had an identity in Australia for football. They, they always copied. So, you know, um, if Australia was invaded by the Dutch, <clears throat> was it uh, before Captain Cook? Well, there wouldn't be any Aborigines left. Uh, they would have killed a lot. Uh, they would have killed the Maoris in New Zealand too. But because it was taken over by the British, um, the British tried to be quite smart and then get the, the islanders to sign a contract to say, yeah, we'll give you our land if we're allowed to live and live with you. 
So that was just the Anglo-Saxon domination of people. Now, if you go to New Zealand, they co they're the, some of the best coaches in the world. Why? Because they have to coach Maoris, Tongans, Samoans, Islanders, um, Italians, Europeans, and they're the best coaches in the world. They're so sensitive to the needs of every single player. And they don't do a course. They learn by doing it. Because if you look at a Maori in the eyes and, and you tell him he's doing the wrong thing, he ain't going to come back to your session. Yeah. Uh, if you're sitting in a room and you kneel on their desk, you rest your ass, you know, you lean back with your bum on his desk, he ain't going to come back again. So there is, and the same thing applies in coaching when you're telling somebody what to do or, or whether actually you trust that player to make a good decision and how you speak and engage them, they're not going to come back. So the big principle in New Zealand is make sure your players want to come back to the next session. And that's the first measure of any good coach. Players want to come back, they enjoy your sessions and they improve. They know they learn. So those are the basics of, of good coaching. And um, that, that should never leave your coaching sessions, no matter how technical you get. The technical stuff is at the end because unless they're engaged, they're, they're only going to copy what you say. They're not really trying to find a way. So I'd, I'd really encourage you to engage in that style of coaching. And, and that, I, I sort of lived through that, really, through Australia and New Zealand. I then coached in Hong Kong um, and learned a lot of lessons over there um, through, through coaching Asians. And then went back to the UK and worked with the England team in the World Cup, last World Cup. Um, I saw a coach, Eddie Jones, who traditionally, if you're a coach, you go through a journey in your life. When you are a professional player or you're not a professional player, you go into coaching. <clears throat> I, I was a professional coach developer for the England rugby. Um, so my job was to take professional coaches and, and make them better coaches effectively. Um, so one, one thing I, I, I sort of looked at was they always start off quite technical. My job is to give knowledge and information to young players who don't know it. Is it? Is it, is it really? Um, and then what tends to happen is they tend to force moments onto people. Right, you need to know this, you need to know that. So what happens, it, it becomes a very strong curriculum. It's very coach-led. It's very information delivery. And there's very little um, feedback from the player, um, understanding their needs. Where is the player right now? What is their skill level? What's their capability? Um, so that, that's probably the issue is very early on as you're a player, you go into coaching. This is how I was coached. This is what I think is good. And some of you out there, I reckon in this group, will not be like that. You'll maybe be thinking, shit, I hated my coach. <laughs> I hated my lessons. I'm not going to coach like that. I'm going to be more like this. And you'll probably have a few role models out there that you're trying to emulate. And that's not too bad to a degree. <clears throat> But you've got to know who you are first, because if you're copying somebody, you're not improving yourself, you're improving your perceived self, not your actual self. So if you're perceiving yourself in a certain way and you want others to perceive you in that way, well, that's not authentic and that won't last very long. So what you need to try and do is understand yourself as a coach, what your <clears throat> basically beliefs are and your values and, and be that person you are. And doesn't, it doesn't stop you trying different things out that other coaches do and, and growing as a coach. <clears throat> and that's part of this process that, that Fabio's got going with Giannis is, is about sharing information, but being yourself. <clears throat> Not trying to copy anyone else. <clears throat> is trying to find solutions to problems that you encounter from day to day in your micro sessions or in your macro, which is the system within the club that you're coaching in. Or it could be, it could be you know, the, the formal education system that's provided. Is that holding you back as a coach? Or is it actually providing you opportunities to be a better coach? Uh, should you rely on platforms like this, which, which are great platforms? Um, I know I'm dominating right now. I guess I'm just trying to deliver some information to stimulate and then we can pull this apart. What I want to do is 
is just I've given you that bit of a background um, on me is is probably just go through um, a few slides um, and hopefully you can see my screen. <clears throat> Fabio, you can see my screen, yeah? Yeah, 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 it's working. Okay, look, the first two slides you guys have got in the Dropbox. Um, <clears throat> so you can go through that yourselves in a few minutes. Um, I just wanna go through a few slides here. I know um, I don't wanna burn up too much time. So what this is, is a continuum of um, moving from prescription, telling players, explaining it, giving demonstration, and this is based around a model. So your game model, let's just say, you've got a very, very strict game model that you're sticking to, all right? Um, and you're looking for any errors and you're trying to detect those errors and correct them. And that could go for an individual skill or it could go for a, a team movement play um, or a formation. Uh, it's all about repetition, quantity, and it's all about feedback and uh, into feed forward. Okay, so what next? What are we going to try and do based on our errors? Um, <clears throat> and so you're comparing. I call this comparative coaching. In your head as a coach, you've got something in your mind <clears throat> and you want to see them perform what you want them to do. So it's called comparative coaching. You're always comparing something. It's very linear, which basically means you've planned your sessions <clears throat> based on <clears throat> based on a point where you want to get your players to and you're trying to progress it in a linear fashion on here is, is more non-linear. So this is where you, you base your sessions on what the players can and can't do. So you challenge them and whatever their capability is, you work from that point. That's your benchmark. So with these sort of sessions, what you tend to get is each session is very closely related. There's themes and there's concepts that tend to drive what you do and how you do it through your session. So you have to be far more adaptable as a coach uh, using the more nonlinear methods. Um, and you have to do this process here as a coach as well. So today we're exploring, <clears throat> we're trying to discover new information <clears throat> and we're trying to adapt to that new information. So your players are doing this on a pitch. When you give them an, uh, an idea or a suggestion, excuse me, I'm just gonna have a quick cough. You know, you're, you're giving them a toy, an idea, a suggestion, um, a way how to maybe attack down the left or um, a particular skill or, a, or a, a particular practice session or a formation. They're exploring it. They're trying to discover the opportunities and then adapt those to the opposition. Um, so you're doing that as a player and as a coach. And this, you need to learn how to be very good in this. Because if you do a session where players aren't exploring anything and you just told them what to do, well, there's no exploration and there's no discovery. They're not discovering what works. How can they use this and then adapt it? So I would always say every session has to have an element of this. And you may emphasize maybe the more this one, adaption. So you may tell them what you're doing. Fair play. Let's go out and let's adapt it to the problem that you're going to face i.e. The, the, the drill design or the game that you've set up. <clears throat> you obviously don't have to mention these words, but I think these themes drive the sessions. Now you can do this a little bit over here as well. So you can give them a demonstration and they explore it and they discover whether that has any use for them as a team or as an individual and whether they adapt that. And if it's good, they'll keep it. If it's not, they won't. So that evolution is very important in your sessions and from session to session, is where the learning takes place. So here there's a lot of trial and error. Um, I don't call it error. <clears throat> it's trial and learn really. If you know, you shouldn't use these words. Um, how can we make a better decision? Understand why the player made that decision and how can you make it better? So I wouldn't use these traditional terms like trial and error, it's just learning, learning to, to improve. Um, it's very self-directed, i.e. if you've got feedback, um, if you've got a player continually asking you questions, uh, we'll talk to that player and say, look, what do you think I'm gonna say? Next time, guess what I'm gonna come back to you with uh, before you ask me that question. So they start to use guesstimation a lot. So GPS settings, our players never get feedback now until they approximately can pick the bandwidth with the data. 
has to approximate what they guess it may be. <clears throat> so we're getting players to rely upon their, their own feeling, how they felt, their intrinsic feedback, we call it. It shouldn't be always augmented from the coach, always giving feedback um, from the outside. It should be player-led and it should be player-to-player. Player. Uh, and then any, any data should support that, shouldn't be driven by the data. Um, yeah, we use lots of analogies, coaching through narratives, lots of cues, uh, constraints, and that sort of stuff. So it's very outcome-based, and they have to find the, uh, the, the, the solutions to the problems. And we use things like constraints. So we can dig a bit deeper in that. But generally, if, when I went to England six, seven years ago, I looked at the clubs, the premiership clubs, and in different sports, and they're very driven by um, the system. The system drives players, not the other way around. So players should really drive your system. <clears throat> and, and let's talk about them being complementary. So if you talk to people, you know, um, and I'm sure Fabio and Giannis will, will have experience with this and you other guys, <clears throat> you, tend to, you tend to put people into two categories. They're either like a people person or they're a systems person. <laughs> You know how you, you go into a big organization and they treat you like, uh, like, uh, like you're not even there? Uh, like, yeah, yeah, come on, sign this piece of paper here. Like, like human resources do generally in big organizations, yeah? You just, you're just another indispensable person. And then at the other end, you're, you've got a people person. Um, they, they forget the system to a degree because they consider people as the system. You are the system. You are the model. Your player is the game model. It's not on a piece of paper. It's not on a whiteboard. It's you. You're going to walk out there and you are our model. So if you want to change it, that's fine. You've got the permission to change it. But there's an accountability and there's a responsibility that whatever you do in your behaviors have to result in improving that framework model. So that framework is you and you have to change it by playing and training and improving it. And that is where the system becomes embedded in your culture. That's where the All Blacks have led the way. Because when the, the, the players change the drills on the pitch, that they've, got, they've got permission and responsibility to, to do that. Because if they do that, they know it's going to make a difference on the weekend. They know that it's going to help them create more opportunities. <clears throat> um, and I'd say that's a very engaging environment. It's very authentic. It's, you know, it, it, players love it when they get to that stage, but a lot of them don't experience that in England. Um, they felt like they're being compared to, to everyone else. Um, so you'll hear words like, yeah, we're trying to produce magic four players in this academy. Yeah, we're using the other 30 players as cattle to help those four players move up. Um, <clears throat> producing, um, uh, production line, uh, and, and it's always I, the coach, yeah, I'm trying to do this, I'm trying to do that. So you, you'll notice that language coming through a lot. So here, they tend to give out hammers in those environments. <clears throat> and so the player picks up the hammer, and what do they see? You know, they see nails. They go looking for nails. Uh, they, they don't get the Swiss penknife, and they don't figure out, mm -hmm, you know, how, how can I use a lot of these informations that the coaches and the sports staff and everyone's giving to me how, how can i be responsible for this pen knife and, and make a few mistakes and try it out um you know and this is skill using this as skill using this you're you're practicing the drill with this here you're practicing the skill so i'd, I'd, I'd very much you know want to think about what's the system capture when you go into an environment as a coach are you appeasing the system are you appeasing another coach or a head coach? Or are you coaching because you've been told to do that? Or are you copying a model? Or are you actually believing in some principles of coach development or learning what's in the best interest of this player development? And does the system support that? Are actually you complementing the system by coaching with the players and through the players? So I wanted that slide there just to, to remind us of that. Um, Eddie Jones uh, in rugby some of you may know what rugby is <laughs> some bloke picked up the football one day and ran with it so um, he created a new sport um, Eddie Jones the problem <clears throat> I can't quite see it because I've got some um, uh, oh here we go I can move the windows 
The problem is players are becoming robotic. They are followers rather than leaders because they get told what to do all the time. They're told where to be, what to eat, what to wear, how to think. You're robbing them of the opportunity to grow as people. <clears throat> so I worked with Eddie for the last six years and we had robots for the last three years and we had to create individual skilled decision makers for the World Cup and that was our job. You know, and these are some of the issues. Um, these players are going back to their premiership clubs and the clubs are setting cultures artificially. There's artificial interventions to set cultures. And we're thinking, really? So as a national sport, uh, when they come into play for England, we let them do that. Whereas they're forced into these cultures and their clubs and they come back and it takes them a few days to be authentic again because they're trying to act like a, a Man City player. They're trying to act like an Arsenal player. But when they come into the England setup, no, no, you're you. You're you. If you want to wear that hat and that earring, that's fine. But when you play, you take it off and, and you play. Um, they also come to the, to, the, to the training environment with all of these structures and plays that they do at their club. No, 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 no. That's not football. That's your style. And that's for the problems that you guys are trying to uh, have solutions for. That's not what football's about for us. So we're about, we selected you because you've been developed and you're skillful. So find a way to use your skill. And we're not going to tell you necessarily how to do that, but we'll end up with a framework for you to end up expressing yourself. And that's what Gareth Southgate's done. He's, he works closely with Eddie and myself and other people, and they change the way they do things over there now based around individual skill. And collectively, the players have to come up with a framework with the coach that supports the players. So it creates opportunities for every single player in that group. <clears throat> They're uncomfortable sometimes because playing back to the goalkeeper, it was very rare sometimes. So the skill set and the decision-making, you have to find ways in, in practice environments so you get authentic movement of the ball. Um, we'll talk about that in a minute. So some of these things here are, are, are interesting issues um, within the... Uh, international environment. Um, you guys have seen this clip. We'll just go through this quickly. You obviously all remember who this guy is or know him. So I won't. Uh... Okay, uh, you guys are the, the experts. You know, you're the football experts. Um, I, I'm coming in from across multi-sport. So what you've got here is a, is a field of dreams almost. That's, that's his garage. That's where he grew up. So he, he's living his experience in there by having the fans. And he's got his goals set up. He's got a cage, as what Man United call the cage. He's created his own cage before the cage got invented. Uh, at Man United. So he's got different balls, tennis balls, he's got different size balls. Yeah. <clears throat> so if we look at that a little bit closer, you can obviously see uh, there's a hoop there as well. So there's a bit of a space to hit it from. But if you look at this in terms of what you can do as a coach and working with your players, <clears throat> he's already acquired the skill as a young boy when he played in the streets. This is the same game as what he played in the streets with his mates, but it's in a nice garage with good lighting and, and you know, paintings and stuff around. <clears throat> but generally in a game, what, what the task goal is, 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 is the most important thing. They develop games because they have this urgency, this need to want to score, score goals. <clears throat> That's the driver. <clears throat> Scoring goals is the driving force. So when you look at skill acquisition research, What's the number one strategy for helping players feeling confident in, um, in acquiring skill? And I'm talking about when they're very young or, or very new to something. It's called errorless learning. There's no errors. 
So you make the goal as big as possible and the kids start peppering balls into the goal. They're scoring goals left, right and center. Bang, 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 bang. And that's what happens in good sessions. There's a shitload of goals being scored. And then what you can do as a coach, you can make the problem bigger. Suddenly the goal gets smaller or suddenly there's a goalkeeper in that massive goal. So now you have to V your shot off to the right or to the left. And what you're doing is you're creating a need in that player to find a slightly different solution to scoring goals. And they may need to bend it. They may need to deceive the goalkeeper slightly. The goal may just get smaller with no goalkeeper and that's harder as well. So you now have to work on a bit of accuracy or a defender comes at you while you're doing it. That's a very simple example on the principles of play. So that principle of scoring leads the way. It leads all your principles. So the outcome of scoring a goal drives your going, wanting to penetrate and go forward. So your second principle or the first principle of play is penetration or in rugby is go forward. They must be in every, every single thing that you do to have that direction. If it's not there, you have what we call not authentic movement. Like if you're playing a game that moves from side to side, you know, and you're trying to create space, your emphasis then becomes the outcome is sideways movement. You only go sideways to find a way to go forward, to penetrate. So the two are linked. So the second principle of width, in rugby we call it support. So it should really be depth as well, width and depth. So how you support to go forward is a decision that the players need to make. How wide should I be? How deep should I be for support? You can be ahead of the ball. That's deep as well. It's, it's, you get uh, deep, you get wide, narrow, deep and shallow. You can be shallow in front of the ball or behind the ball. So those are decisions that players need to make themselves. And they do that in the street. They do that in backyard footy. They don't need a coach to tell you, shit, we're losing 5-0. We're going to put uh, Fabio in defense. We don't even say defense. Fabio just drops because we're losing 5-0. So suddenly we've got layers of, of, of um, roles and responsibilities just emerging from the game. And those abilities are key. The principles are already emerging of, of penetration, width, and depth. And what we're doing as coaches is we try to take control of that and manipulate it in a way when you go into what we call organized coaching. And you've got a big role to play as an organized coach because you can either take their power away and take their control away and then it's all about me as a coach or you can actually keep the players engaged and let them learn and you support that mechanism going through. So what I want to do is just quickly go through some of the things you can do here. <clears throat> Those principles of play are linked to the environment. They're linked to the, the game rules and regulations, okay? So in football and rugby, you've got to score a goal. That's your first law. To score a goal, you've got to get it into the goal, the back of the net. Well, that affects your first principle. <clears throat> You're gonna to have to go forward and penetrate. So your first principle is linked to the rule of the game. The second rule is, well, it's defense, I can tackle you. Well, if I'm gonna tackle you with a ball, you need support. So you need support with width and depth. So your second principle of play is linked to the law of the game. And so your width and depth are actions, decisions which are based on the rules and the laws of the game and the opposition that puts the problem on you. So those are skills. They're not models. They're, they're skills of players knowing how to move off the ball, knowing where to be, knowing where to support. And often your model gets in the way of that. <clears throat> In fact, with talking to Jurgen Klopp and Liverpool guys down in the academy, their models get in the way of everything. So they work more on depth, work more on feel. Where do you feel you need to be? Of course, you have responsibilities within that, but there's a lot more flexibility. But you need skills to do that. You need to be a young player who's, who feels free to move and create opportunities for those around you and not be narrow into you have to play the ball this way or that way. <clears throat> um, obviously the mobility and the improvisation comes through that sort of training. You'll be more creative, more skill on the ball because you have to be able to control the ball and then control your opponent to be able to man manipulate those situations. So these things come hand in hand. Um, 
That's the principle of support. <clears throat> he could have brought another bloke into that cage. And then you bring different rules in. One touch for the first ball carrier, and then the second player has to score the goal. There could be any myriad of, of rules and spaces that you have to score from. Um, and then the environment. You know, you can put different textures on that wall. So the ball bounces off in a slightly different direction. That ensures that each player can't be too comfortable. They can't predict the bounce off the wall because if you do, you start to anticipate too far in advance. If I anticipate what you're going to do and I start to move too quickly, you will deceive me and take the ball the other way. And that's what the Brazilians used to do and, and, and the Spanish. Their action is based on your reaction to my first action. And, and that's when you're caught just reacting the whole time. So here, you need to put equipment in the environment and the surroundings that forces your players not to over-anticipate too much, okay? When you have a model, a game model, the opposition can see that. They know what options you have. They're not stupid. So that scenario that I gave you on those two pages there is about an English player who gets treated like a robot. And they're the problems that we're dealing with right now in our coach development. And I'd hate to see you guys go through the same issues. And I think you should be learning as a group in your region, in your area, and using these platforms to bring up these issues and find ways around them. Just a quick slide here. Um, in the middle, game performance. It's really all about the game. Um, and I've, I won't go into all of this, but if you do, if you do a breakout from playing a game in practice, there needs to be a reason why you break out. I wouldn't start with drills or technical stuff because it's about the game. Kids love the game, so you play a game. And the game gives information uh, to be able to then break out. And so on the top right, um, if you need players to see information in the game a little bit easier, make it less pressure, less complex, then you may have a manipulated session where it's amplifying information. They can see the cues a lot easier. And what happens is they, they tend to regulate their action. They'll change their movements based on that information. <clears throat> you can tell a player in the game, of course, in the middle, if, you, if you're very good at coaching in the game, people like Pep Guardiola and, and Klopp, those coaches coach in the game. They don't stop and have a drill. They keep the tempo of the session and the coach has to stay at that tempo of the session. You're coaching at that tempo because if you stop it or slow it, your players then are non-authentic. They're listening to something in slow motion. You've got to keep it at the same tempo. You've got to run around. You've got to, you've got to be a player, an extra player almost. So on the top right, you're amplifying information um, and then you're altering it. So for example, if you freeze your, your training session every now and then and show the picture in front, well, if you ask your players to freeze, who would, who, who would actually set the picture up? Would it generally be the coach or the players? And ask yourself that question because in a traditional approach, it would be the coach. You know, Hey, go back to where you were. You were there, you were there. Let the players do that. Let the players recreate scenarios because that's what they perceive. That's how they feel it was. And you may, you may then learn something from that because that's not what you thought. And then you can challenge that and just go, Johnny, I thought you were a little bit over there, were you? Um, some coaches are afraid to go into that because it means opening up. It means engaging and interacting with players. It means being vulnerable. It means being seeing not to know the solution every time. And that's where you need to get to as quickly as possible if you can as a coach. Um, the bottom right is about simplifying the game. So if you come out of a full-scale 11-11 game, you're going down to a modification game. But you're keeping the same principles. You're keeping the same concepts. They never change. But really what you're doing is you're repeating certain scenarios or certain events on a higher basis, more repetition. <clears throat> And you often don't get that in gameplay. So the reason why you come out is to get the more repetition. But those repetitions will change. They won't look exactly the same, which is great. And, it's, and that's where the player's responsibility is to make sure that they control those scenarios. It's them. It's not you, the coach. On the left, 
maybe you come out because <clears throat> you want to get rid of a, a problem there. Like say somebody can't pass 15 meters, a young kid. Well, you're playing these games and all the kids are like a bees around the honeypot. They don't have the capability or the skills to be able to play in a more expansive way. So you'd come out and the rate limiter is the passing ability. So how do we accelerate that skill so it becomes no, not much of a, a problem again? It doesn't slow down the rate of progress in the game. Remembering everything has to go back into the middle. The only reason why you go outside is to, is to improve the game performance. So you have to have a reason and a purpose to come out of the game. <clears throat> and, and, and then you go back into the game. So you may have some passing drills, <clears throat> but you put them into a game. And that accelerates those skills. So when they go back into the, the normal game performance, they start to see different opportunities uh, start to emerge because their capabilities are slightly different. So <clears throat> the top right is more about <clears throat> decision making. Shaping players' intentions is often quite hard in uh, full games, um, unless you're a very good coach. So you have to design games which invite players to do certain actions. And you can tell them, like I said before, you can prescribe them or you can invite them, okay? And invitations are a very, very good way to coach. Your best coaches are very good at this. And it doesn't happen overnight. You have to have confidence. You have to work through your player, not at your player. If you work at your player, it's going to be more prescription. It will be more telling, which, which is okay at times, of course. But what we're talking about is you're trying to develop decision makers who can adapt on the pitch. And to do that, you have to invite actions. It's almost like giving a suggestion, an idea, um, or challenging your players. Let's see in the next 10 minutes if we can play through these guys. And of course, if they're players that are used to doing what you say, they're going to play right through the middle for the next 10 minutes and, and it won't work because the defense will see what they're trying to do. So they're going to have to find a way to spread the defense to play through them. And so really, you've got them. You've challenged them to find a way to do, to do skill A um, and you make skill A explicit. You have to learn skill B and C to get to A. So skill B and C will be implicit in your session. And really, they're the skills you're more interested in. So you have to play those games. If I'm trying to get you to skill C and make that explicit, well, skill A and B will be implicit. And I have to find a way to get to A. And that's how you've invited them in your sessions to find ways. <clears throat> All right. And then once you've invited those actions, what happens is they perceive the situation and their attention is based on where they're focusing to find that way. Well, they'll probably come back after five minutes of that small side of game and say, oh yeah, it's easier when we move the ball quickly to the side and we wait for the player to move across and then we change our depth and then we move the ball real quick the other way. And then we'll find normally a way through the middle. It's because their attention has changed. They're not focusing on the model or their own movement. They're focusing on the effect that they're having on, on people around them and the, and the opposition. So they're perceiving differently and they're starting to see these opportunities. And I call them shared because football is a team game. You can have one brilliant player that can change a game. Yes, of course you can. But our role is to make sure that the players are supporting each other to make each other look good. They're creating opportunities for each other. Combinations. All right. You, you, you've got two players or three players in a triangle. You could call that a system. But if you rotate that triangle um, to the right, 90 degrees, it wouldn't be 90 degrees, would it? Yeah, 90 degrees to the right. You've got different player in different position now, but it's still a triangle. But you've got different opportunities available to you. So those shared opportunities are completely different based on the context. Okay, and players' capabilities within that little system. So it's not system driven. It's individual driven but they need to find ways to connect to create more opportunities. And that's a part of that practice on the left-hand side. So we tend to do a lot of those. I'd say Klopp and Pep and Eddie Jones do a lot of that sort of stuff on the left. Um, again, I'll come back to it's trying to improve performance in the middle. So you start in the middle, you finish in the middle, most of the time is spent in the middle, um, but you do breakouts. And there may be more than this as well. I've only put four up there. Um, 
You may be not fully understanding each one of those, but we can certainly talk about that in future, future sessions, not an issue. I'm aware of time. I just wanted to get through quickly um, the affordances. So when you look at this graph, don't get, don't get confused, man. It's, it's opportunities here are called affordances. So what does, what does uh, playing with Giannis and Fabio for me afford me? Well, I've got two guys here who are better than me at football. So instantaneously, I'm going to put myself into a position here where I create opportunities for those two guys. So that graph there, I've got affordances and we've got a scope. How many opportunities does my system now uh, promote for me? So if I've got Giannis and Fabio, I'm going to put them into key positions to, to help make them look good. And I'm going to do the easy stuff, the, the basic stuff. And that little system is going to create opportunities for me. So the scope of opportunities I have now is quite wide. Now, kids do this themselves in a, in a game without coaches being there. What we do is we redesign that whole scope of opportunities without them knowing. They have to be part of that. So that scope of opportunities can be quite wide or it can be quite narrow. And if you look at the graph going a long time, how many opportunities can you see that that system or those opportunities are creating for you over time? So I can see now I, there's more ways of penetrating. If I've got um, Fabio on the left and he's good at working that defender, there's more chance if we get him into a position, we've got more penetration. So we, we start to find that those opportunities, which are the bar graphs and the height is the strength. So if they're quite high, we wanna to get to those quite quickly. And I can see in time over the future. So the pink ones at the back, shit, if we get Fabio into the, into the penalty box area, as a third man, and I'm going to use Giannis to get there, well, I may have to play a couple of passes, but I can see that opportunity emerging quite quickly. Bang, 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 bang. Balls in, shot on. Um, but these, don't, these are not static. These, these disappear and go up and down very, very quickly. And so this is things like the rondos and games where you're trying to link those opportunities together and see them and act upon them. As, as a group of players. And it ain't easy, but that's what you're trying to do in terms of your session designs. And so as a coach, you're working with the player, the player agency and the environment. You have to, you have to create an environment that gives players opportunities right at the beginning. And that's key. If you don't, and they're not part of creating those opportunities themselves, i.e. they just do a drill, and they can't say, hey, coach, can we move Johnny to the left? Am I allowed to come up? They, they need to manufacture and develop those, those formations and positionings all the time themselves. So if you're a coach who coaches young kids, allow them to come up with a strategy. Give them a few minutes, give them 30 seconds to have a bit of a chat, have a huddle, have a timeout. Let, let them have three or four timeouts whenever they want, whenever they choose. <clears throat> and they may choose a timeout because they're getting slaughtered and the opposition three up and they want to break the tempo. Coach, time out. Great. It's a tactical timeout. So what are they doing now with their strategy to self-organize so that they can create a problem for the opposition to break them and then get back into that game? So opportunities uh, in the England World Cup, um, we had <clears throat> every training session had this opportunities and missed opportunities, just two whiteboards after every training session. So every player would come in and write down opportunities taken in training and opportunities missed on the other board. And of course, it's simple, but the whole effect was trying to reduce the amount of information on the missed opportunities and opportunities taken to maximize that side. And that's the player's responsibility, it's not ours. Ours is to put on the session, to give support, to give video analysis and real-time feedback um, and design stuff with the players so that they can start to take more opportunities. And the principles of play is, is the framework that sits around that. So, yeah, with your affordances, uh, for example, number 10, making that move, if, if, if affordance opportunity number one is greater than number two, he's going to make that run. All right? It's not something that's prescribed. And what we found in our research, the information that these players have that others don't is relative. 
relative information. It's not what we call absolute. The way we coach, if we coach prescriptively or off models, it's absolute information. It's we are doing this. And if the player, it's if and when coaching. If the player comes here, then we do this. That, that's the same as prescription. Uh, it's if and when. Whereas this is empowering a player to make a move with a combination with another player based on relative distance, relative position, and relative angle. And relative means rate of change. So his distance at the moment could be, let's just say, 12 meters. But he knows in about two seconds' time, if he goes for affordance one, it will be 15 meters. Can he cover that five meters in a certain amount of time? And the ball angle as well factors in. That's not a calculation he makes. That's an intrinsic feedback piece of information based on himself and the other guy next to him. So have you all seen the messy clip? The more you move on the pitch, the more information you create. The more information you create, the more opportunities you start to understand are available to you on the pitch. So you have to find out where the players are following you, how quickly they can move. Um, if I come over here, what are they doing? How, how do they react off me? And then what you start to do is you're creating this relative information that feeds into opportunities. And then the players that normally distribute the balls to you, they may start the decision by making the pass. And you can see he's already angling in for that pass. So automatically that player there has judged the relative information to make the move. I'd like to think if 10 wasn't going to make the move, the ball distributor would not go through with that pass. And he could change his pass at the last second. So skill training involves passing, but changing the target point at the last second. That's the only way you can really have adaptive skills is don't have predictable outcomes all the time. Keep changing the outcome because then the skill has to adapt all the way through to the point of contact. All right. And then you get very, very adaptive players. <clears throat> you shouldn't get them to predetermine where they're passing to. So things like, you know, you guys know better than I do, the traditional rondos in the circle. When you're anticipating two passes ahead and suddenly the defender shifts, you will, you will have, to, you have to adapt your pass in the moment. And that's what skill is. That's skill. Skill is not premeditating and then getting the ball off to him quickly. That's just action. That's action. That's not skill. Skill is, is making it effective in that moment to the changes that happen. So I call it change to change, a bit like Bruce Lee. Um, who, who talked about his own style. He has no style. My style is based on your style. So that, in effect, is, is decision-making. So that's what we try and create. Um, it's what the All Blacks do. If, you watch, if you've watched the All Blacks play, the first 10 minutes, 15 minutes, what do they do? They move the ball. It's not the model. They move the ball based on finding information about you. How are you guys going to react on the left? How are you going to react on the right? If we do an overball, how are you going to react? And now they're creating all this relative information. After about 15, 20 minutes, bang, 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 bang. They move the ball into very, very specific situations and cause you to react. And then their next action is based on what you do. And they get results like that. And no team can really keep up with that. It's very, very difficult unless you train and have a culture which allows you to change like that. So... I think English footy generally is, is, is heading more that way. I call it sphere of influence. So if you, if you have a player like number 10 here and they're used to creating that sphere of influence, uh, of opportunity, that circle grows and grows. So if you have two players and their circles overlap, then you're dominating those areas because you've got a sphere of influence. And you're attracting five players or six players into a very small area because your sphere of influence is so powerful. Um, and that's, that's skill, you know. Um, and, and, and often you have to dribble the ball to do that. It's not ticky-tack, one-two touch. It's a decision is to take the ball and attract players. And where do you keep the ball? Do you keep the ball underneath you and attract the player in? Or do you move the ball out to the side and hold it under the foot? like a matador in bullfighting and invite somebody in, those players start to see opportunities around them because then mastering the ball is related to opportunity. You can't do ball control. You can to control your coordination of the foot, but it should be linked to opportunities. 
So doing any sort of ball mastery should be linked with perceiving how you're affecting people around you to create those opportunities. Otherwise, it's just an isolated movement. It's not a skill. And that's, that's one thing I, I'd like to emphasize. Um, I'll just quickly race through this. So this is a continuum of opportunity. On the left, you have planned action. And on the right, you have reaction. So you tend to move between those two as a player. And actually as a coach right now, you're planning your next action for your next, next session. But when you get to your session, you're going to have to react off the players. Maybe they've had a bad day. Maybe they don't want to sit through your session at the beginning because they're just not in, in the mood for it. Maybe they're at one of the riots right now, you know, planning a protest so they don't even turn up. So maybe, maybe you've got to react as a coach, you know? So you're, you're, that, that's what I call decision-making. Decision-making isn't sitting at one end or the other. It's moving between. And when you move between, it's called interaction. They're your best players, your best coaches. They're constantly interacting. They're shifting from end to end. In fact, I like to do this with our players. We tell our players something. It depends on their skill level. You may tell your player, oh, I want you to do this. And it's complete bullshit. You've just told them a complete and utter lie. It's wrong and it's not going to work. He gets out there into the session. Fucking hell. Coach, why have you just told me that? So, right, you know, it took you two minutes to realize it was wrong. So what you're doing is you're really testing that player out to see are they just copying a planned action or are they actually trying to react off it to see if there's any opportunities available. So in rugby, we did it a lot in the World Cup before the World Cup. You know, number 10 is the decision maker in the back line in rugby. He's the first receiver. And if he calls a call and it's the wrong call, we're looking at all the other players outside who will listen to the call and they'll just do the play. And some of the players just... Some of the players just carry on with that play. And others are like, hang on, that's not right. And they'll overcall it. They'll shout a new play based on what they're seeing. And those players are the ones that adapt really quickly. And they're the ones we want to bring through to the World Cup. And they're the ones actually that beat the All Blacks when we played them in the World Cup with the young guys who, who were overcalling based on what they saw. So they're the guys that interact in the middle. Um, you've probably seen this. Okay, based off a little uh, reaction there. Once you once you do a drill and you prone, prime somebody, you've got to move on quickly. Yeah. If if you, if that was a drill and that that real guy was in the second trot, the second repetition, say he was in the middle, there's more chance that that player probably would have adapted. Because it's the third or the fourth, he goes in using the same technique and then suddenly he's, he's just on autopilot, all right? That's the sort of behavior you need to watch out for as a, as a coach. This is the Australian junior team when I was at the Australian Institute of Sport. <laughs> Yeah, you guys know probably know basketball better than I do, you know, being the home nation. But where's the option there? Yeah, it's quite clear where it is. The guy, you know, that guy there's opened himself up. Where's his mind right now? Where, where is he on this continuum? Yeah, he's down here. He, he's playing the play. He's not playing what he sees. You can do both. The play, the play is to help you play what you see. It's not either or. So the framework or the model is there to provide an opportunity. It's just a toy and you throw it away once you've got your opportunity. You don't need it. So we've got a number of players based here that, that will carry on. <laughs> Okay, so that sort of stuff's happening a fair bit, unfortunately. So in, in a lot of our training sessions, what we try to do is we look at a continuum of engagement. So on the left, we've got static and then dynamic engagement. So if you do any drills and it's in isolation on the left, that's fine. But that's more to do with um, no engagement with any opponents at all. 
Um, there's no changes to any of the constraints you put into the practice. Um, and it's scripted, it's called rehearsing. So you might be rehearsing something. Uh, it's a bit like your NFL over there, you know? You got to, it's one of those sports, if you're a European or from Australia, New Zealand, you either love it or you hate it. You know, it's just a bunch of robots running around. But at the end of the day, you've got levels of adaptation going on as well. I think sometimes, you know, on how you're working your opponent one-on-one. -on -one. But, you know, I think, was it Chip Kelly? There's a fellow there a number of years ago. I used to follow NFL a lot 10, 15 years ago. And there's a guy there who increased the speed of NFL to, to a speed where no other team could keep up with. And I think it was at university level when Philadelphia, maybe, <coughs> Chip Kelly. And um, I know when he took that through to the more senior level stuff, it, other teams adapt to break it down quite quickly. But when it was working with the uni level, what happens was no huddles. It happens so quickly that players don't have time to pre-plan on the left. They go, they go straight into the next play. And therefore, the coaches can't coach. There's no time in training to coach because Chip Kelly would make sure that there was no huddles allowed for the coaches. The, you weren't allowed to take a player out of the game. And the way they measure that 10 yards, he, he made that happen in 30 seconds or less than that. So the game in training was, was continuous. And they put the music up in the stand so the players couldn't hear the coaches. There was no feedback. So the coaches actually had to run around talking to individuals. Um, and that's, that's where we, we're looking at that level of engagement. Um, so if we move towards the middle there, it's more about having an opponent. Um, you, you, um, the opponent knows what you're working on. They know your skill selection, but there's subtle adjustments made. So there's a little bit of pressure on what you're trying to practice against your, uh, against your opponent. So it's, it's priming your, your opponents, priming your defense. And the last one on the right there is, is uh, unscripted interactions. It's purely about skill being functional. And so that's very adaptive. It's what we call bi-directional. It's, it's purely ta what we call tactical warfare. And you need your players in here for a large part of the session on the right-hand side because it needs to be tactical warfare where they're trying stuff out and they're learning from it openly and authentically it's it's not in the middle because it looks good in the middle and it looks good on the left and it gives you this false sense of security but a lot of players truly like it on the right even if it's not necessarily working but you have to then bring it up and down on that continuum to give them a sense of less pressure okay um, seeing those opportunities coming out of the session and then breaking back in again um, so yeah, tactical adaptation, that's interaction, that's switching, and that's where your players need to be talking about the strategies, the tactics on the pitch, in training, changing stuff the whole time, constantly, finding out what the problem is, moving players around, not waiting to be told. And that can start at a very early age. A lot of the questions are generally, should that start at, you know, 15, 16? Well, you know, what we'd say should start at six. All right. Players can see each other. They don't have to talk about um, a call or a play or a formation. They, they can just move uh, and feel their way through. So it should happen very, very early. And it does happen, these tactical concepts in Spain and Brazil and um, where I've been into AIK as well in Netherlands. They're doing it earlier and earlier, but they're not, they're not prescribing models now. And there's no selection as well. There's no selection until a later age. Because what they want the players to do is just to tactically understand the game. So when they come out of the academy, they can play for any team in, in, in any country in the world, in any club. And they can play football. They understand the game of football. And they're not just playing a particular style. So, yeah, principles are there to create opportunities. Uh, it's, not, it's not a model. They're there to provide opportunities and, and, and we coach that way. So I'll, I'll give these slides for you to share, but we won't go through them all now. Um, and they're generally the principles of play. And so we, we coach a lot through that now in, in England football, England rugby. Um, and the way you've got to find ways to coach this way uh, in the session to create scenarios and tactical situations for that. Um, yeah, that's just a, a final slide here is 
if you want more repetitions uh, and in more game representation, we need to spend more time here. About 80% of your session should really be more representative of the, of the game and high repetitions up here. Try to avoid staying down here for too long. It should go from here, then back into here. Um, <clears throat> okay, it's less representative here, um, but more variability in practice, which is what you want, that more variability. So <clears throat> the environment you need also needs to be reflective of um, players being in this area here. When I went over to the States recently, I went to America, US rugby, uh, was looking at their, helping them out with a bit of coaching and they spend all their time in this side. They've got their coaching level one, level two, level three. Everyone's comfortable knowing what they should be doing. There's models and all the players are on autopilot. They're in their comfort zone. There's a shitload of rehearsing going on in the rugby over there. And there's a lot of repetition. And if you look at the players, they don't look bored because they're very good at acting to pretend that they don't look bored. They're very good at looking like they're interested in American rugby. Um, they're just, they're like actors, you know, and, and they have issues when they go onto the world scene because everything is scripted and, and they, they don't have any idea when, when things slightly become more chaotic. They don't understand how to adapt to those situations. And there's an element of complacency uh, it's not a negative thing, but it's like, yeah, yeah, we've ticked that box. Yeah, yeah, we've covered that. We've done a drill for that. We've done a drill for this. And they're trying to artific artificially make themselves feel comfortable. <laughs> and at least a complacency. Um, cranking the handle. So what we're trying to do is create a bit more uncertainty. So in a session, you never feel like you quite get it. You leave that session or that drill feeling like you haven't quite got it. You still need to work at something. And every good player that you guys know will be like that. They'll be on the pitch side thinking, God, I've got, I've got, to, I've got to improve. We, we can do this better. And you go through your whole career like that. You never reach perfection. Uh, and you as a coach have to make sure there's not too much uncertainty, of course, in the way you design your practice. You need some transfer. But effectively, you need to be up this end here where you're creating uh, like the the gameplay which is continually evolving through the players they're continually finding ways to break down and create threats or create new opportunities and this is a, a a diagram which i like because you can move into all of these for sure you may come in here to get more confidence they actually sometimes get more confident down here because it's so certain what they're doing and it's so safe you warm ups are here towards the end of the week each week if you're playing a match on the weekend you end up being in here but you've got to come back in here this is what the All Blacks do so well. I'll tell you what, Richie McCaw, Danny Carter, Kieran Reid, they're the leaders in the team and they bring the team into here just before kickoff and then they shoot back in here. Uh, Richie McCaw will say to the youngest player, hey, if we've got a line out on the 22 and Australia don't set up like the way we've practiced, what are you going to do? And the guy goes, I don't know. Well, we haven't done it in training. Shit. It's like, yeah, what are you going to do? So they specifically ask certain players to be uncertain. They'll ask questions to unsettle them. And what happens is the player starts to, to expect the unexpected. And what happens is their awareness becomes higher and they start to look for things. They won't fall into the comfort zone and they go out there. And that's why the All Blacks always, always find a way in a tournament to win. They're always looking for ways and they get better and better and better in a tournament and in a match as well. Over 80 minutes, they just get stronger. They rely on the principles. And I, I think that, that diagram was, is, is key. So for that, your, the last slide there is, is feedback information. Um, players need to rely on themselves, how they feel. What did they see? What did they hear? What did they feel? Okay, that's what we call intrinsic feedback. And if you as a coach keep intervening in this process before it actually occurs, then the player never trusts themselves. They don't, they don't know how they felt because they don't trust it anymore. They'd rather trust the coach on what you felt and what you perceived. So you've got to let this happen. And they normally in Australia, we call it the 10 second rule. Allow someone to process something for at least 10 seconds. Allow them 
what you notice if you ever do a drill and their head goes down when they have a recovery and they go back to the start or they just have a rest, the head goes down, they start to reflect and then it comes up and then they look around. That's a sign that they're opening up now to what we call extrinsic information. All right. You've got to let that first process take its course. And the extrinsic, which is augmented, like it's extra information, should come not from the coach. It has to come from the player to player. So it comes from the opposition. So how do you in your sessions have your defense or your opponents feeding back to the other team to make them better? Because a good player will. If the defense know the attack's getting better, the defense have to get better. And if the defense are getting better, the attack gets better. So that player to player. And then finally, player to coach you then become part of that process and then video analysis. We've got too many players in high level sport in England who say, yeah, we've got video, don't worry, we'll, we'll discuss it tonight. Um, that's what we call delayed feedback. Uh, it's so too much delayed, you can't adapt in the, in the training session. So we cut that out and say, no, you've got no video today. So if you ever said that, well, what would happen is these two start to become more important for the player they know they're not going to get any video so they have to sort it out in the in, in the moment and they use players to sort problems out and then the coach becomes largely redundant and then you become more important because they're trying to sort it out and if they can't sort it out you're more important now because the the, the, the problem's really important whereas if they, they come to you with all this other shit because they know they've got all these other ways of creating information you're not that important so I think the process or a framework of feedback is really important as a coach and you need to consider what's your role as a coach and what, what's, your, what's your philosophy as a coach. And I just wanted to throw that one up at the end. Um, coaching is really important. Um, I won't go through this slide here. We'll probably do that a bit later. Um, so look, I know it took much longer than I thought there, Fabio, but I, I wanted to get that across because I think, I think you know, there's some of the areas that I've been talking to Yanis about um, that particularly excite me, um, but I think they sort of reflect the problems within coaching um, in Australia, New Zealand, uh, UK particularly, and I'm in Asia right now, I'm in Singapore, I work with football and around Asia too, and they've, they've, they're behind 100 years. The, you know, they're copying the British models or the American models right now, bringing players in and just copying. So what you see is different countries on that journey at different stages. Remember I said we start off technical, then we get a bit more tactical. It's all about giving information to the player and then suddenly we become more cultural. We have children as a coach. Those of you who've got children, what's the lesson? <laughs> Coaching is like bringing up kids. It's, it's not no different. And then you become slightly a more sensitive coach. And then you start to become more about psychology or, or, or questioning. And then you start to realize you actually don't know a lot of stuff. And then you become a bit more observing, a bit more calculating, a bit more asking questions. Okay. That's the general journey. All right. And we've got evidence to support that. So what you're trying to do is figure out where are you on there? And it's about you. This is about you today. This is about, it's not about me. It's not about the people who host the show. It's about figuring out where you are and where are the kids that you coach? And is there a, is there a fit? Do you need to adapt to yourself? So you're not so, maybe, maybe you're very uh, cultural. Maybe you don't give any te technical tactical, and maybe you're thinking, I'm just not a confident coach. I don't know the game well enough. Well, you've got some experts on this, forum right now who if they come to you and they're good people it's not about them telling you about technical stuff it's about them understanding you and understanding why do you need that technical stuff if they know why then they'll give you information to suit the solutions that you need and the problems that you need the worst thing is to bring somebody in just to tell you everything and be prescriptive that's not what you want this information sharing is about knowing who you are as a person where you are on your journey, what is it that, that, that you're good at, and where do you need to improve? What will make you a, a better coach? And I think that's my journey for 30 years has been just working with different coaches up and down that pathway. And I'm sorry, I shouldn't use the word up. For you, if you're thinking right now, 
if I'm improving as a coach, where is up? Some of you may say, I want to coach the Canadian team. I want to coach the American team. Is that up? Or is it, no, I want to be the best under 16s player there is. I want to understand how the players are developed through that phase of their journey. So you need to understand players from 12 to right through to 17. Okay. And so that makes you the best coach. You're going up because you're getting better at what you do. So don't always think that it's using the players for yourself to become recognized and moving up through the, the player pathway. That's, that's wrong. So it's trying to create learning opportunities for yourself that support what your needs are as a coach. So yeah, you should have three goals right now. What is it that's going to make you the best coach um, that you can be? Uh, and how do you get in, how will you get that information? How do you share? How do you coach with other people? Invite, play, uh, invite coaches into your sessions. I'll finish off with that one because Eddie Jones, he had five coaches in our practice sessions that the English, we have a CEO, we have a lot of money involved in our sport. And they could not believe when Eddie Jones was inviting coaches in to watch our sessions before test matches in the World Cup. We had the opposition coach watching our training session from Wales. Warren Gatland came in and watched our session and we were playing them in two weeks time. And he could hear the calls. He could hear what we were doing. We, the, the English were shitting themselves. Uh, whereas the Aussie, he's Australian, he was laughing thinking, well, you know, if he knows that as a player, you're gonna have to improve. And you've got two weeks to improve and change what you're doing. So the whole emphasis of inviting a coach in who could actually be a better coach than you. If you were to do a guest session, that coach may be much better than you. And that's a test of your resolve to talk to the players and go, guys, it's nice for, for Jimmy to come along and coach you. Have you picked anything up? What, what did you like from today's session? Because it could actually, you lose your credibility and those players love that coach a bit more than your sessions. So that's a test for you to be able to open up and, and use information around you to, to, to go through the players. They are the players and, and they'll figure if, you, if you're supportive of that coach coming in, they'll sense that and they'll, they'll trust you 100% and they'll stick with you and they'll play for you. So try, try and create an environment where you really do share that information, but manage that information. When the player leaves, the coach leaves, he may have a different model. So you can actually say, why did that coach ask you to do this? Where does, which club does that coach come from? Why do they play like that? Okay, here's some homework, tactical homework for this week. Go and figure out why those clubs play like that. Okay, and then, and then why shouldn't we play like this? Or why should we? So you're developing football players. And that's, that's really what we've tried to do in England now. The, we've changed the whole FA pathway. The coaching has gone more formal, uh, informal and non-formal. It's more like this. It's more about taking a concept and then finding out what that means uh, by sharing information. So it's, it's less threatening. It's less comparative. You're not going, yes, I've got my UEFA, I've got my level one, two, three, because that makes you into a, an outcome coach. Oh yeah, I've, I'm, a, I'm a great coach because I've got this qualification. You're not. It's an entry ticket to be a coach. It's just a, a meal ticket, you know, but once you're there, bang, now you've got to really learn and, I think I'd come back down to explore, really exploring as a coach. So can, I, I've done a lot of talking and I'm sorry about that. And uh, Fabio probably thought I was gonna do this. So Yanis, can I uh, feed back onto you, mate? Would you be able to sort of sum that up in a way? And, and then I can move forward with that. Look, there's, if I can show you my book, I got about 30 questions written down and, and I guess the, the biggest takeaway for me is, is you use the word sensitivity early on and how important that is. And, and really what, what I think your deeper message is, is how can we help increase that sensitivity or in another word, increase the awareness of a player so that they can take more ownership in perhaps a world that, that's trying to take it from them through a loss of perhaps identity and stuff, which is funny about this crisis and this time we're in. But that's mm -hmm. kind of the biggest piece for me is you're really just trying to help raise the situational and self-awareness of the players. And of course, as coaches as well, which is an important part of the puzzle. It's like um, how, well, you don't want to obviously, but you're creating an epidemic in your team. 
you got to create epidemics basically and then what happens is the whole system reorganizes itself around new individuals so you guys know better than i do so apologies if i say this wrong but black lives matter uh, but of course they do well, i mean why are we having to say something so obvious um because the system has probably become disintegrated it's become siloed and and certain factions or certain parts of that system become prioritized and what you've got to do in your club and your organization is re-systematize i've talked about system capture at the beginning who've got the hammers who's telling who are giving out the hammers and treating people to look for nails maybe we maybe the player should give the hammer to the coach so i think i think that system is 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 right you're sensitizing players and sensitizing basically means so players can perceive and pick up information better if i oversensitize you to and i put you into a game model you become less sensitive to other information and you become highly sensitive to game model related information it's just the way it is you can actually say well let's sensitize you to information that's important at that time and that's a decision that the player needs to make through that attention so they have to attend to information that's going to help their players and then be more effective and that's really the epidemics causing that right now there's a there's an in, there's a, a gap between um socio-cultural uh economic status between between communities and what happens is these problems highlight those areas um whether it be a lack of biodiversity in animals because of over over farming and america is probably the worst i mean it's probably going to lead to the death of the planet quite soon unless we have nature as part of our economic model sustainability and biodiversity because the the animals are becoming so over farm they're creating new pathogens and new allergies and new 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 viruses that will kill us off quite soon and it's and, and it's the way that the planet will self organize the whole system and kick us off we won't have a say in that so what you, what you have to do is create a biodiversity in your team. But there has to be a biodiversity in your team. Otherwise, you're evolving it like uh, Barcelona, who now are realizing it's the end of the road. And they need biodiversity. They need to change things a little bit going bottom up. It's, and it's no magic thing. It's obvious. It's, it's, you need to look at things in this way so you don't copy any specific club. You can understand the journey that they took, but that diversity is is creating sensitive players why are we doing what we're doing the way we're doing it every player should go to your session and not expect to know what they're doing for the next 60 minutes there needs to be an element of excitement wow what's going to go on here wow look at the, you notice when you put the markers out they know exactly what the fuck they're going to do the heads drop but we've got this game again Fuck's sake. you know and so and suddenly you give the markers to the player and go hey, you put them out but I want you to work on this. And then, oh shit, back to my backyard games days now. Oh, imagine if a player, you know, you do a one-on-one -on -one and you as a coach put the markers out and then the players look at each other. What, what, what do they go through in terms of sensitizing their awareness? Well, they know the markers are set, so they can't set the space. If they do a one-on-one -on -one and I've got to beat you, if I set the markers out, I'm going to look who I'm playing against. I'm playing against, um, Giannis, he's slow, man. He's slow. He do, I don't need much space to beat him. So I'm going to move the markers based on my capabilities and his. Now I've got ownership and I've been challenged. And now I can recreate the environment to suit my challenge against him. And if you give players that engagement, what happens is their awareness picks up and they start to make decisions and change and adjust and it's, it's so easy, isn't it? It's not rocket science, but it's actually taking these concepts and actually uh, looking at your own team and, and shaking it up a little bit and letting it settle again. Don't, Alex Ferguson used to do it all the time, didn't he? He used to get rid of two players, top, top players, like a year or two years before they were due to, due to retire. And it used to send a message to the team, shit, what's going on? Fuck, two best players are gone. Constantly evolving, constantly evolving. And the team had to reshape itself. So I think, yeah, to come back to what you're saying, Giannis, it's, it's developing awareness. Um, uh, and that's perception action. Perception is to perceive information. It's another word for awareness. Awareness is information. Awareness is information 
to help you adapt quicker than the opposition player or your opponent. Um, fancy word is anticipation, but if you go too much and anticipate too far ahead, you're too safe. You need to be able to use information, discard it or keep it. And that's the decisions player, the, the player's decision. It's not ours because they're the ones having to make those decisions. So you hold them accountable the whole time. You say, should we be doing this? Should we have changed? Could we have? Um, and then it's always a question to the player about could they have done that better? Do you think we need to change the framework? Every match, every, every practice session, the, the framework should change. Very, very small should evolve based on the individuals and, and the training session. And that is creating more awareness in the players, a lot more awareness. And they're responsible for that. We're accountable for providing the opportunity in training. Um, you know, and I think depending on your player's ability, if they've got a good game understanding and tactical knowledge, then they should be co-designing with you. They need to co-design together. Um, so you start the thing off, but they can evolve it themselves. And you need variations in your training, at least two to three variations to the game um, that, that actually progress the game. That it doesn't say a stagnant game. For, like in England, they play the same game for 10, 15 minutes. And they're doing the same thing. Uh, there's no evolution. So I think that's a big part of coaching is, is evolving a concept quite quickly throughout the game. The game does the teaching with you. You're in the game. But the game has to evolve your, your strategy, your action, your decision as well. It needs to change. And the players need to come off knowing. How many of you ask players in a huddle or at the end of the, of the game, why, why you guys three nil down? You didn't you didn't adapt to the problem in front of you. How come? You know, who's leading that session? That's coach led. The players should be walking to the huddle, going, "Fucking what? Why? Why haven't we? Why didn't we change it? I told you we should have done this. We should have done that." They should be doing that before they get there, if they're a tactical orientated team. And then what happens is they should be leading the feedback. The feedback should never be led by the coach. Never all come into the same spot, drinks, and the coach starts the feedback. That's very coach didactic, very coach led. They should already be talking before they get there and solving the problems. And, and that's, that's interactive. Um, and what na naturally happens is, imagine if you didn't say anything in your huddle. Silence, just stood there. Right, Fabio, one of your sessions. If you did that, how long would it be before your players started to talk? If you just remain silent, how long do you reckon? Well, I like to think that they would have been talking right away with myself, but I've seen them, you know, kind of sit around and wait at times, but uh, I yeah. guess it depends on the coach and their demeanor. Yeah, well, if you go into different environments, it could be up to three minutes. I've been three minutes where the coach looked at me and Generally, what will happen if you go into a huddle, the coach is either in the middle or standing side to side, which effectively shows me as a coach developer your, your level of hierarchy. Um, but if, if the players are already talking, uh, it's very, very what we call feed forward. So the, the game provides the feedback and the feed forward information is being generated all the time. So they're already discussing it. You don't need a huddle for that. It's real-time feedback from player to player, and they're bringing that into the huddle just to create a awareness amongst the group. So, for example, let's just say we played a game and, and Joey or Mike were getting frustrated in the game, and they could see a solution, but it wasn't getting across the team. Well, where's our system? Where's our learning system in our team to take information and share it and change like that? Well, if you're relying on a huddle, to do that, well, that's your stimulus. And, and you're always gonna be dependent on that. Whereas if Mike saw the solution and he shared it quite quickly, and he saw the problem, we would have solved that before the next huddle. The game would have evolved. So game evolution is quicker. So your level of adapting is so much quicker. And that's what you need in your teams. You, what I call it a learning system without you. There should be a learning system without the coach that, that, that's set. So people evolve really, really quickly. And you don't, when the epidemic hits, which is the opposition striking you three times through the same place, what are they going to do? Fuck, an epidemic. Let's, let's have some riots. Let's get the coach sacked. This is a shit model, man. 
I can sort it's your model, but you know, it will get you sacked, which is what happens in England. Rather than taking the responsibility as a player and adapting and seeing the problem and giving them the toolbox and the tool set to be able to, to figure these things out. So we're really trying to give techniques to players as tools to solve problems. All right, that's what a technique is. It's just, it's just a, a tool to solve a problem. And that's our feedback process and that's our evolution. Um, and so when we do get the epidemic, we don't have a revolution. What we do is we have continual evolution continual evolution and and that's what we are we're like little darwinians um and you have leaders in the team little fabios little yannis's little mikes little joeys who are who are all in that team and if they've got the wrong kit in the warm-up session before the match and they've got the wrong colored socks on before the coach even gets down the players have told that player hey hey get the other socks on quick they're already self-organizing and solving problems rather than having like a fining system and all that crap, you know, you know, let them self-organize that. Um, just make them accountable a little bit, you know, in a, in a way. Consequences in, in, a, in a positive way, not through punishment. Consequences through if we continue to behave like this or continue to, to make these decisions on the pitch. Well, you know, that's a bit insane, isn't it? So they make that choice. Um, so I'd like to come back to... If I'm not sure whether we have time, Yanis, to to maybe splinter off for those two slides. <laughs> we can spin it any way you like. Like we could do the case study. We can leave the case study and maybe have a Twitter kind of discussion later, or maybe yeah. it could be a, a piece where we get some groups to share some reflections from today. So however you'd like to spin it, we can we can make that work. All right. I think obviously the time probably getting away so maybe q a is it is there anything we could we could start to feed off or yeah yeah well first off i <clears throat> richard i can't thank you enough i mean this is exactly how i thought it would go um i told you the last time we spoke i got goosebumps today i had a lump in my throat i don't know i'm going through all the emotions here it's fantastic i absolutely enjoyed it it was lots of fun and i felt very comfortable listening and taking in all this information it's um you know, it's so exciting. It's so exciting to hear this type of philosophy, uh, if you don't mind me using that word, being reiterated and, and talked about. I'm also going to hold you up to the fact that I heard you say that maybe this is something we could revisit at another time. I caught that. I don't know if you caught that about yourself, but uh, everybody else did. So we're going to for sure have you. <laughs> we'll have you back on and maybe we could get into a little bit of a group discussion as well, if you're okay with that. Um, yeah. Yeah, I was thinking that as I was going through these slides, I thought, no, I'll cut off after the third one and go to the scenario and we'll break up and make it interactive. But <clears throat> when you're on a roll, um, I think it's it, when you, one of your players is speaking in your huddle, it's nice to let him carry on, isn't it? Because he feels it's important to say something. So you, you, hearing people out, and I'm not saying I'm important or anything like that, but I think these messages have resonated because of my chats with you, Fabio and Giannis, over a, a short period of time. So I thought I'd get that out there and then what we can do, um, I'm more than happy to dig deep. So I call it the, the tea coach. You know, we've gone across a few areas. Let, let's go down a little bit as well. So let's be a teacup coach and um, dig deep. Yeah, so, so if, if you wanna, if you wanna just for now, maybe stop the sharing of the screen. If anybody wants to open up their, uh, uh, if you, you can use the chat box below as Mike has made mention of, or um, if you wanna use, the audio video and just uh, make yourself heard and uh, ask a, qu a question. You know what? I've got one, um, Mike, I'm not sure. I saw a question. Uh, here it is uh, from Kareem. Thanks Richard. Can you give us an example for the game performance chart practicality, practically at a drill? Is Am I reading that correctly? Um, I think he's asking for, can you give us an example for the game performance chart? He's referencing the game performance chart uh, and possibly a drill in that. Um, I think that was the second slide with the game in the middle and then breaking out into those different areas. So um, he's talking about how would you use a drill maybe to support game performance? Yeah, so, and, and I think that might be what he's saying. So <clears throat> can he speak or? 
is he allowed to speak on here or? Yeah, yeah. please uh, ask away, Kareem, if you feel comfortable. Just so we know that we uh, asked that correctly. I, I know that it was up there, sorry. Oh, yeah, not, me. We could always come back to as well. Uh, like I said, My the voice like, is good. Yeah, hi, Kareem. Can I speak? Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Richard. We, uh, it's very informative. Um, chat i hope you understand my english i don't think is uh, quite uh, good very good um it is very great philosophy uh, it is now in egypt uh, maybe 4 a.m wow and um, <laughs> i resist to sleep because uh, uh, as you know the webinar was very very uh, uh, enjoyable um, I want to ask, uh, yes, on the second slide, on the game performance, which uh, was in the, at the middle, because uh, you referred to uh, repetition without repetition. So I want to, what do you mean exactly uh, when I put it in the scenario of the game as a training drill? Yeah, uh, good question, Karim. <clears throat> really good question. Good morning as well. So, um, Repetition without repetition was a phrase used by a Russian um, scientist um, and he, um, he came up with this uh, phrase because when we look at movement, um, it's very difficult to reproduce the same movement twice do the same thing twice because obviously we're human and we we change from moment to moment so in effect what we're looking at doing is is not trying to rehearse something too many times so you're not repeating the repetitions you're repeating without that repetition which effectively would mean that well what are you repeating so you have a choice of can you repeat the outcome so <clears throat> that's what we call adaptation. So let's just say a drill will be just to take a stationary uh, free kick into the goal and you're practicing by yourself, a very simple skill. Uh, well, e um, uh, an easy skill to identify. So it's just a stationary flat, um, stationary ball kick. There's many ways to get the ball in the back of the net. So the outcome is being repeated, but the process is being adapted. So the same outcome, different process. Um, a scientist used to call that form versus function. So you've got a different form, but the function remains the same to score the goal. <clears throat> so that's what drives a lot of players, you know, finding a different way to curve the ball, a different way to hit the ball off the left and the right foot, a different arc, a different trajectory. So what happens is normally if you fix the outcome, the only thing that can be varied is the trajectory and the way you kick the ball. So when you do skill development, it's very interesting to use repetition without repetition. You can actually give the player certain instructions to fix certain outcomes. And then all they can do is control other variables, which will be the technique of the shot, the trajectory. Okay. Um, that's repetition without repetition. Um, <clears throat> so you're repeating the outcome but the process is, is adjusting. And that's called adaptation, movement adaptation. Those of you who are really into science, um, they call it um, uh, dexterity, movement dexterity. Okay, dexterity is the sign of skill. It's just changing your movement form to create outcomes which are the same. All right, and it's very hard to replicate that in practice. And generally people try to do repetition with repetition so it looks perfect the same every time. Other people will have the fixed outcome but do a different process each time. So you can have that within the process too. So if your process becomes the outcome, let's just say the ball trajectory. It's not about scoring the goal, it's just about the ball trajectory. You want it the same every time. Well, that becomes your outcome. But now what's the process? Well, it's the technique now. It's more about how I move before I contact the ball. So it's more what you would call technical. Um, how do I adapt and repeat something slightly differently to make sure I get the same arc? Why would you ever do that? Well, if you were trying to score a penalty, deception. 
disguise. The Brazilians very good at it, doing the capoeira, doing the Brazilian dance, the Spanish dance with the lower part of the body. It's the same outcome, but they're doing it in slightly different ways. And it creates information that I said before, and it sensitizes you to their, to their body and they make you follow the wrong thing. So they give you false information <clears throat> deliberately. And that's part of repetition without repetition. It's very good for deception and very good for creativity. Now, you don't just have to do that as an individual skill. You can do that as a team. You know, NFL are always doing those deceptive plays. It's orchestrated on a team level. <clears throat> okay. But it can only happen in sports where you've, it's like start and stop very quickly. It's a discrete sport, NFL. It's not a continuous sport. If you look at a continuous sport, you've got continuous motion. So it's very hard then to plan, create, uh, sorry, pre-plan creativity and deception. It's very difficult. <clears throat> but what you're trying to do as a team is trying to recreate that. You're trying to make the defense think you're doing one thing and then another option opens up like third man. <clears throat> so repetition without repetition, uh, hopefully I've answered it, but it's a very, very important concept. Um, we have certain rules in our training. Once you practice something more than twice and you've got it right, then you're not allowed to do it again. You've got to move on, increase the challenge. So all our players uh, make sure that they don't get too comfortable. Once you can do a movement, you take away that, that problem and then you give them a new problem continuously. Um, and and their, their mindset shifts. They become very adaptive minds. They're not fixed. How many players have fixed mindsets these days? You know, they're looking for the perfect model. They want the coach. To, uh, we want an adaptive mindset. And to do that, the problem's got to continually change and continually unsettle them to make them think, hmm, got to keep doing more to get better. The problem's going to change. But what you're doing at the moment is good. You've adapted. So if you fail, you fail to adapt. All right, you don't just fail, you fail to adapt. So they know there's a way out. They know that if they do fail, shit, there's still a way to actually to, 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 to improve and win. I've got to find a way. So that finding a way is a massive skill in training. Um, and they need, they need to do that. So repetition without repetition is, is a way of moving away from drills. The traditional word drill is, <clears throat> is to repeat the outcome and the process all together and, and replicating that. And um, the only reason I'd go down to that <clears throat> is if the problem is coordination. So if some player has a movement problem or a movement pattern and they, they can't, they're not used to say, let's scooping the ball. I can't scoop the ball. Well, I, I need plenty of repetitions at trying to scoop a ball. So you may say to a player, look, go, go and do some reps. All right. And you may, you know, Tiger Woods did it with his old man not being coached. He had a tree in front of him and his old man put a bucket on the other side of the tree and he put it so close to the tree, he had no choice but to actually put backspin on it and, and loft the ball really high. So he just left his son there for a couple of hours trying to get the ball into the bucket. So of course that player there trying to do the scoop shot, um, they're gonna repeat that many, many, many times. And what they're doing is they're finding different ways to do that movement and they're getting feedback from the trajectory all right, that trajectory is giving them the real feedback to know how to manipulate that ball and their technique next time. So learning takes place between repetitions. It doesn't take place inside one repetition. All right, so it's like your training sessions. Learning takes place between sessions. So if you don't link your sessions, you're fucked because you've basically got isolated training sessions that make no sense. You have to link your themes and your concepts so you get evolution. Um, and the same thing can be said for drills as well. You need to link one drill, uh, one repetition to the next repetition to the next repetition. So hence, it's no surprise that the research shows you that never give feedback every single repetition. Because what happens is they then depend on you for feedback. They don't depend on the trajectory or the feel, all right? They need to be part of that repetition evolution. And, and need to change things in accordance with information. So <clears throat> your process, really, your role of a coach is to help direct them to information. Where do you search to be more aware 
to, to adapt your next um, repetition of movement. So in effect, I, I do a lot of those breakouts. Um, um, Karim, I, I would do breakouts that involve challenges where players are having to get feedback and, and, and change what they do from rep to rep to rep. And then what you do is you ask them for feedback, which is what we call summary feedback. Yeah, just tell me, how did the last 20, 20 shots go? It's like, yeah, it felt real good. And, and then suddenly I changed this. And then bang, it, it worked or it didn't work. So those, those are tools that the players need to solve problems. Um, a, a nice one I use is, is um, I'll do repetition um, with repetition sometimes just to fuck up the players. And what happens is, is you say, right, two groups. You guys are practicing. Um, you're going to be doing this formation or this technique, and you guys are doing this technique on this formation. You're doing exactly the same. Break up into two groups. You've got 10 minutes to practice, and then you're going to come together, and you're going to play that exact technique. So they're thinking, shit, we're playing a game, game against this lot, doing the same thing. What's going on? And they go away and they practice. Just watch them. <clears throat> watch which group thinking, okay, crikey, they know what we're doing, so how can we change it? And they start to take this thing, like a toy that you've given them, a model, and they're starting to play with it, thinking, how can we create some problems with this for our opposition? And when they come together, you get this almighty uh, competition going where they've taken a structure or a model and they've turned it into something which is them they know why they're doing it they know why they're changing something and, and that's a great way that's repetition without repetition you're giving them something to repeat but they will change it knowing that they're gonna have a competition against the team that knows what's coming at them <clears throat> so it could be the same thing you both got to play through each other you get points for playing through the middle you can either tell everybody or not tell them and then tell them individually so they don't know what each other's goals are. And then when they come together, it seems to be a tactical conflict and they've got to find a way. That, that's that's the, how you train decision-making. So I know it took a long time to answer that, but that's repetition without repetition. It's taking something and adapting it and changing it. And the outcome can be a goal or it could be where the ball lands or it could be the process. The actual process itself can be the outcome. If the process becomes the outcome, then you need new processes that the player can adapt. So new micro processes. Um, if you're working on a skill, individual skill, um, what, what's the difference between technique and skill? Does anybody wanna just have a rough guess? And there's different words used for technique as well in England, unfortunately, um, between skill and technique. They use a different word. Um, they use technique, but it's really skill here in England. Richard, End we have point. a comment here from yeah. Alex Newby. So it says, technique is biomechanics, whereas skill is that in context. Mm, nice, nice. Um, I'll just support that and back that up in a way skill where is the reaction of the decision making of the opponent or your teammate to like a decision making. This is a skill. Mm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's uh, it's definitely a skill, Karim. Um, uh, decision making, to me, there is no one point like traditionally when i was in australia with olympic athletes as well team sports we used to do decision making testing we'd have a video and we'd stop it and then we'd say decision why did we do that because we were top down coach driven by the dutch playing a 4-3-3 and their decisions are made at specific points in time footballs you can make your decision at any point it's not at one point where the video stops other players would have moved and changed before that moment. So you can't train decision-making by stopping a video and say, what's the best decision here? Because most of those players wouldn't have got into those positions in the first place. They would have done something different before that didn't lead to that situation. So it's about group learning. It's about watching video and watching your decisions unfold. So the definition for decision for us, Kareem, is, is constantly adjusting and regulating your movement, adapting on the pitch. So you never have to make a massive risk decision. You don't have to make big decisions. You're constantly adjusting and regulating and moving. 
So decision making in effect, it's not the magic decision. The ball carrier should never make a decision. The players around them should invite them to move the ball. And so you constantly get this flow of movement where there seems to be no decision making. It's seamless. It's a, it's a flow. And that's because we're all aware and we're all sensitive to information. The ball goes where it feels it needs to go. The ball feels it needs to go, they will go there. You don't put pressure on the ball carrier to make the right decision because then he shits himself. Ah, oh, am I gonna make the right decision? No, no, you invite him to make the right decisions by moving and creating those things. That's a, that's a different sort of paradigm shift. Um, and to do that, they need a lot of responsibility. You need to support players in a safe environment and you never criticize a player for a decision they make, never. You just try and understand why they made that decision. What information did they use to make that decision? And how will you help them be more effective in those scenarios next time around? Okay, and they feel that support around them. So they're more likely to move in a very authentic way, a way that they think suits the game. Not they're working off a prescribed model because what will happen under pressure, the cognitive model will interact with what they're seeing. And then you probably call it a system error or something like that. Yeah, you shouldn't have done that because our model says this. Well, it's not what I felt or saw. And then you get a split division in players, you know, acting on impulse and then others who are sticking to the framework. So of course there's a balance there, but you want players to feel the ball needs to move to the left. It's not, the model or something dictates it should go there. So you've got to feel it's the right thing to move it there. And when the Dutch came to Australia, we had a 4-3-3. <clears throat> they didn't take into consideration that we have a hard ground. We have no grass in Australia. It's rock hard sometimes. That ball shoots. And our kids didn't have enough ball control to control the ball coming from a long way. And then they were getting dispossessed by teams coming at them. And we couldn't create the ball movement and the tempo and the rhythm because we were trying to just copy a 4-3-3 in Australia that didn't suit that at that time. Um, we, we had gone to Brazil a lot and we, we learned how to compress and spread. And we knew how to compress and spread the opposition. We were very good at that. And then suddenly the Dutch came in and we played a 4-3-3 and we're all really wide. And then if you speak to the players, they were all frustrated, but no one ever said anything for five years because they thought that's the thing to do. That's how they were gonna get selected. This is what I have to do. They weren't learning 4-3-3 as a tool or a technique to solve problems. If we'd taken that approach, it would have been completely different. And then it would be more of a hybrid. Players would be making decisions to use that for deception and then move away from it or stay within it. How do you do repetition without repetition with a 4-3-3? Easy. You have variations off it. That's what the repetition of the repetition is. And then they realize what opportunities it creates and that becomes their evolving framework to move from and then become really good football players, good tactical understanding, good game management. And that can start from very, very, very early, very early. Um, they become the game. They are the game. Um, so yeah, really good question. And I think, sorry, that was Karim. And then going back to... Um, what was the first question, sorry, again, from that guy? You posed the question to the group, Richard, about technique versus skill. That's and it, so yeah. Alex's remark was technique is biomechanics, whereas skill is yeah. that in context. Yeah, yeah. Look, I, you, it depends. Because if you look at the individual, then the guy kicking the ball to a, to a target with nobody else there, well, what's the skill? The skill is is effectively doing it under pressure. So that pressure could be, he's just by himself, let's just say, and he wants to get the ball in the top left-hand corner of that net. That, that's a skill to be able to do that. And the pressure creates the variation. Shit, I've got to get it first time. So as a coach, you may say, you're only allowed to hit one shot from each position on the ground. So five markers in different positions, only one shot from each, got to get them in every time. That's, that's pressure. The skill is to get it in effectively to the outcome. So you've got, you've got pressure like mental pressure, arousal, um, the, the expectation of the coach. Um, if you miss 
a particular shot, you have to go back to the first marker. So that's technical. The technique of getting that shot in turns into a skill, i.e. it's got an outcome, it's effective. So you call it biomechanical, yeah, you can call it kinematic, you can call it uh, process, i.e. the movement process. Um, the key thing is the end point. So if you talk to biomechanists, biomechanists or kinesiologists or movement people, they talk about endpoints. So the end point of a technique is where the, the, the foot hits the ball. The end point of the skill is where, do you think? Getting the ball to the right place at the right time. That's the skill of the technique. So you can be technically proficient, i.e., we used to use this with Eddie Jones, the English rugby players, they're perfect at passing because they have no pressure in training. And their whole technique is timed off no, my brain. It's not timed off people around me. So if you take a technique, you can be technically proficient, but if I pass it to, to Jimmy over there and he gets completely dispossessed or smashed, it's not very skillful but I'm still technically proficient. So what we're looking at here is skill. Skill is relational. You can't isolate skill. You can't train it in isolation. You have to train it with some form of information that feeds into how you regulate that action. You may speed it up. You may change the direction. You may increase the execution or the follow through or the, you know, the timing of it. You may actually change your technique completely to do something different. Uh, that's skill. So uh, yeah, skill is, is involves technical, but the end point is different. The end point is the effective outcome. So I, I'd work like that. Um, and, and therefore you don't end up having these arguments, technique versus skill or drill versus game. It all depends on the purpose. What, what do you feel is the purpose as a coach? Do you feel that that, um, that player technically is not good enough and he's affecting performance in the game? And there's a few other players similar to that? Well, make a decision. Do you feel that a group needs to come out and play a particular game where they work on that technical concept, but you put it in a pressure activity with the endpoint being not the technical endpoint, it's the skill endpoint, but you reduce the pressure so they can focus more on the technical endpoint. I need good contact with the ball. Okay, well, let, let's put less time pressure on the skill endpoint and make it a little bit more certain. So now that they get to focus on a little bit more time to adapt their movement technique, i.e. biomechanics and kinematics, okay? Better still is training your athletes to do that themselves. Go and say, go and practice and watch how that they constrain endpoints and outcomes. And then which players they get to play with them to put pressure on them. Basketballers are really good at that. You know, in the warm-ups, they, they pretend or imagine someone's in front of them so that they can practice a particular move. They're recreating that endpoint and that pressure in their mind and they're, plat they're warming up against nobody, but they're doing all these moves. No different to a football player like Beckham with his kicks. He's imagining a wall in front of him. He's imagining those pressures in front of him. Um, so I think that's a, a real skill. So it was correct answers technique um technique can be also at a team level not just individual technique could be um uh, a, a particular formation or a uh, a particular pattern of play that's that's a technique but if you train that in isolation in team play well like the dutch did we had a lot of patterns going up and down and then they introduced one or two defenders and what happened was the whole ball timing, you know, just went through, uh, had a, a major issue with ball tempo and control and timing because there was nothing to time it off. So you need something to time your movement off. So how you bring in your defense or your pressure, your opponents, you can, you can do that quite carefully to make sure you're putting pressure on certain parts of the timing of that ball movement, or you put the pressure on certain players or certain parts of that formation that create information for them to move it more effectively and adapt around them. Um, so yeah, you know, at the international level for the World Cup, we had a very good defense that trained specifically our attack for the World Cup. 
you know. So our attack was training against a really prime defence that were very good at simulating Australia, um, uh, Wales and the other teams. And they would do things unpredictably. So our attack was never fully expecting it every time. So, um, you know, it's just a good little trick. So, yeah, technique can be individual, biomechanics or, or team. So the biomechanics across the team are all the players coming together. Each player is like a joint in the body. And the joints in the team need to, need to move together to create that endpoint. Um, so how you get to that endpoint is, is, is a coaching skill. We'll, we'll do in a future workshop, I think, Fabio, where we look at implicit and explicit. What do you make explicit? And what do you allow implicitly to occur in the training? Uh, I think it's really important because traditionally we love to make everything fucking explicit. And, and, and it goes against learning in a way. You definitely make certain things explicit, but the things which are implicit are up to the player to control. That's their toolbox now. That's how that they can change something. Yeah, and it's really important to think about those things before any session. What do I say? Keep it simple. Set, set the context. And then the skill needs to match the context. Otherwise, there's going to be a mismatch there. And you won't get transfer into performance. All right, you, you have to make sure those contexts suit the skills needed. Otherwise, the, otherwise, different skills will be needed, which is fine. I mean, if you go that way in your training, players learn stuff that you didn't really um, preempt. And I think it's always good like that at the end of every session. What the focus was and the theme was, actually, what else did we learn was important to do this? And they'll tell you, shit, we had to do this. We had to change this so to get this. Uh, and those things are from implicit to explicit. So they learn implicitly, but they go towards an explicit. So you make it like a, you can make things into a policy sometimes. You know, that's how models are, evolve. Shit, we keep doing this and it's, it's brilliant. It leads to this. If we stay square and we threaten penetration every time, it's creating space. So you make it a policy or, or, a, or a principle. And those things then change the way you play. They become like who you are, your DNA. But I don't think you should start off with that because then they're comparing something to something. They should start to evolve within your sessions. And that's very good coaching. Yeah. Um, I'm liking this. Listen, I, 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 can, I can be firing off a whole bunch of questions. I know we're a couple hours in. Uh, the, the crowd hasn't moved. Everybody seems to be on, so I'm sure there's even more questions that are there. Uh, I'm not sure. I'll even, uh, again, we can use the chat box on the side there. And Richard, if you're okay with a few more, I'm not sure if uh, Joey and Mike themselves had one. I do, actually. So, so Richard, um, in, in my role, I'm a director of coaching for, for a youth club. And, um, you know, we're, we're going through a process of designing our, our, our framework for the club and, and the development model. And, um, you know, one, one thing that I'm trying to build is, you know, a game model. And, um, you know, we've made some positive steps. But at the same time, uh, you, you raise some great points about it's a lot of it is based on the identity of the players you have. And that dictates the model in, in a lot of ways. How, how would you say, like, in terms of a process as a director of coaching, when you got tons of teams and tons of different players. Um, you know, what recommendations would you have in terms of how we would uh, go about designing that? Yeah, I, uh, there's no right or wrong in this. And I think that's where I want to make that clear is, is, you know, we're just coming up with, with suggestions and ideas and we exchange ideas. Um, <clears throat> some, some may be more based on evidence, i.e. science. Um, but even then we need to question it as well. Yeah. So I think when you look at any sort of pathway, um, again, we're talking about technique and skill. So where's the endpoint? Is it a model? And if the model is the endpoint, then why is it part of the process or at the beginning? Um, so one of the questions we've asked is there is no game model until that's the outcome. That's where they need to get to. So before that is, is another endpoint. And that endpoint is in like in junior academies or pathways is we just need to understand football. We need to understand technically, tactically the game of football. So we can play any model 
we can play any style. And that's, that's been a deliberate focus now and a philosophy of, of mine anyway in the way I work with coaches. But I would never say to a coach, you have to do that. I would work with a coach who may be trying to play like a Man City. Hence, that they can go down to under fives and have a model for under fives. But there's a little chance if that five-year-old was to stay at Man City, they go elsewhere, they're going to survive. So you can ask yourself this question, what's the purpose of what I'm doing? What's, am I trying to develop the player or am I trying to develop a model and force a player to a model? You've got to make that question. And, and, and that's a really interesting discussion to have. And it's a philosophical chat that I think needs to happen between coaches before they decide to go down these pathways uh, and force models onto people. Um, it's obviously easy in Man City for, say, like Pep Guardiola to go in there. And they were expansive anyway. But, but that's a highly structured model. It's highly structured. And there's no degree of flexibility for anybody to play a different way. Um, so you have to ask that self the question, are they good football players? No, they're not. They're not developed in a great way. Uh, I'm not saying Man City now. I'm saying if you had that model going down, top down, then really what they're doing is you're preparing and producing um, these, these, these almost robots to play those positions. And it becomes very role specific, very, very technical, uh, very, very early on. And what tends to happen is that model will go down and further down and further down and even further down till, till when you reach a really young age group. And then what it does, it starts to go against a lot of what we've discussed today, which is about making players see things and make decisions based on what they feel they need to do. Let's just say if I'm a natural dribbler, well, that's going to be taken away from me very, very early on maybe by a model and suddenly my strengths that make me who I am that could get me selected for many different teams will, will not likely happen because I don't get a chance to further develop that so I think there's a lot of considerations that need to go into any sort of game model <clears throat> which um, <clears throat> which will be systemic I mean a game model is a system um, and then you've got the other uh, which is the players the player's individual skills and collective skills, as we've said. So you may get in your region of, of, of Canada or the States, certain players, which are quite fast, let's just say, or tend to be quite physical. I don't know. <clears throat> if your model doesn't fit that, well, you're fucked. You know, you, you, you have to think, well, shit, I need an adaptive framework based around how my players interact and what their capabilities are. You can call them strengths, but just capabilities. Um, but the principles never change. So any sort of model which is bottom up should be based around the principles, i.e., how do we penetrate with six slow guys, but who are very good on the ball, got very good technical skills. The principles remain the same, but the, but the repetition without repetition changes. We have to find different ways now to move forward, to penetrate. How do we support with our width and our depth? Well, a model fixes width and depth. It's a formation. It fixes it. It makes the decision for you. No, no, we don't want that. You guys decide based on the situation. How wide should we be? Should we be deep? And then what happens is they don't use the model. They don't use a name. They just think this is right what we're doing now. And they start talking more. They give feedback more. And then you can call it something after that. So we, we have a lot of playbooks which are empty. They're actually got nothing in them. And you give them to a player. And at the end of the year, they've, they've written everything they've learned. And that's their model. But they don't get to see it until the end of the year. So that, to me, is learning. That's, that's real learning. <clears throat> you can give some guiding principles in your playbook, which guides them, like different ways to penetrate as a group of players. Um, as, as, as a defensive line or a midfield, how do we penetrate? How do we work together as a subsystem? How do we work as subsystems to achieve the bigger principle? Those are learning moments that, that get put into the playbook. And what happens is at the end of the year or the end of the whatever, the week, <clears throat> we talk to each other and we compare notes. And, and whatever is consistent and remains stays in there. And what doesn't disappears because <clears throat> it's not part of that evolution and it's not deemed as necessary. So I, I think using the principles as a, what I call um, 
opportunity driven. The principles of play are there to create opportunities. So if you give them like in your syllabus or your curriculum, your curriculum should be based on the needs of the players. So it should be very flexible based on the players needs. So you're coaching what's in front of you, not from here. You're not prescribing and then using a benchmark, which is what you've dreamt up. The benchmark is them. You set a problem, they interact with the problem, and then you coach based on how they've interacted. And that, that determines what you do next as a coach. You can still have your plan. Of course you can. But the plan is, is just to have a plan. You don't, you don't execute the fucking plan. You actually change it. So I'm more concerned about if I was a coach with a player, like I still coach, <clears throat> what did you change? What did you switch? Why did you do that? It's because, oh yeah, the plan was working, but then they, the opposition anticipated it and figured it out. So then we changed and we did this and we did that. Brilliant, sweet. And that's because they got the skill to do that. And that skill is in your curriculum. So we have a different set of skills. We don't have skills like passing and heading and whatever. They're, they're just general habits, they're movement actions. Those happen because of the interactions. I'm far rather awareness, decision-making, responsibility. Did you take responsibility of defending the back left? <clears throat> I don't mind you dribbling out, but you knew no one else was gonna be there. So why did you dribble so far? So then you have these discussions with players and they're in control, you're not telling them. They're actually gonna tell you, well, I, I just thought somebody would cover me. And that's not their fault. That's somebody else didn't adapt because they were trying to do their role and they didn't adapt to somebody next to them. So then you bring those players together and they have those chats. And they do it in a video room. They should be watching videos together and talking together so they don't get into the shit. They adapting, constantly adapting and, and, and talking and solving through problems. So really what I did in England for the national rugby team was I did this top down. So in 2013, we, we created this pathway for 16 year olds through to the England under 20 World Cup. <clears throat> so we, we developed in 2013 and then after that we we won three out of four World Cups in, in England rugby. Uh, three out of four World Cups, and we'd never done that before. Um, and the guys scored more tries than they ever have. And when we talked to the players after the World Cups, how did you feel? <clears throat> they said, wow, this, it almost feels like you've been set free. <clears throat> a lot of them, it feels weird because they spend their whole career in a premiership club doing comparative movement and playing to models because they're paid to play a certain way. If you do this, we'll pay you and we'll keep you. So they need to understand that they have to do that. That is a skill. A skill is to copy what the coach says and do it. But the player needs that level of awareness of decision-making that they don't always do that if it ain't gonna work. And they have to make a decision with the coach. Am I gonna go against what the coach says here? Or should I just, that coach is not that educated and he's trying to just get us to do something? and he's very coach-led, well, I have to play along with that because I need my career, I need my contract. That's a very good decision by the player. And we need to develop players that can make those sort of decisions in a very unsafe environment. And then eventually the coach starts to, I, we've done it in our academies over here where the, the high level coaches start to see players coming through the academy, which can do not only what the senior team does when they train against them as, as what we call transition players, Academy players come up and they transition against the senior team in training. Not only do they know the plays and do the moves, they do it better. They actually take it and add a bit of spice, add a bit of individuality to it. And then the first team players are going, fucking smart ass little cunt, you know? He's, he's trying to fuck us up, this little player. No, 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 he's just better than you. He just takes what you do and, and he adapts it to the context. So that's what we're doing in our in our systems right now is we're not top-down models yeah we definitely do have them but the young player at 16 knows why the senior team plays like that they do that because they're playing different teams at senior level they ain't playing under 16 teams and they play this way because they've got three of the world's best players in those positions who do those skills really well so why not put them into those situations and play that way so they understand that what they need to understand in our pathways is their own capabilities and why we need to play in different ways to find different solutions. <clears throat> so their toolbox 
is a lot bigger by the time they get through to the 16, 17, 18, 19. You're not telling them what to do and how to, how, whether to use the hammer or the screwdriver for this. <clears throat> They're doing it naturally and implicitly, but it takes, to be honest, to answer your question, mate, you have to have a system that's supporting this. You can't have two coaches that like this and the rest of the system doesn't support that because it won't work. It, you know, you will have to have the power to just take control over your age group and no one interfere. But then what's going to happen is the players go out of your session into the system and talk to other coaches or backroom staff and get the messages in a different way that doesn't support that, 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 sort, of, that sort of mentality. <clears throat> so it, it does have to be um, like a, <clears throat> what I call a methodology. There needs to be a strong methodology in your club. And you need to revisit that every week as a group of coaches and staff. And you need to talk about your vision every week. Because your vision could change. Not too much, but your vision needs to be clarified every week. <clears throat> Remember, guys, we're here because we love footy. We like to play a fast game. We want to be skillful. And we want, we want players to be able to do shit out there without us having to tell them, tell them that's the way. And that creates your vision, which then creates, well, how do we do this? And then how, you, how do you design sessions? How do you give feedback? Uh, how do you set up practice? All of that should complement that. Because if it doesn't, then they're, they're the chats that you need to have every day. And if you don't have them, what happens is you get drawn in to a six-month review, performance review with a big boss. He's going, mate, hey, you fucking doing some stuff which doesn't suit what we're doing. What's going on? And, <clears throat> and that's feedback but on a professional basis every six months a year. You should have it every day because we're talking about the vision every day and it's shared, shared philosophy and, and philosophy. And I think that's the successful clubs, the really successful clubs have a strong methodology, i.e. like Barcelona. But, but if you stay with it, it starts to die out and people, it will have a shelf life unless you keep reinventing it slightly, i.e. players. Players have the right to change the direction of where you're going because they are the model. And what we're doing is we're supporting the players to create a new way that's suitable for us. But it's underpinned by principles. And so you need to keep re-emphasizing key principles that keep the stability of your future. All right? And the other role of the coach is to reinforce maybe the future game looks different. I don't know, maybe the game rules will change in three years, five years, seven years. So what you need to do as a coach is you, your role is to let that information and drip it down to say, hey, guys, three years time, you won't be, you'll be doing something different. So don't keep doing what you're doing now for too long. You, you need to start to explore different ways because the game's going to change. Um, <clears throat> even the environment, the ground surface, don't train on the same surface for too long. Do the same skill, but change the surface. Change the weather conditions. Go to a different altitude. Um, train, train under different pressure. You can do the same thing, but just change the environment that surrounds it because that, that skill, major, major skill. I always remember that World Cup when they designed the ball with less dimples. Remember that? Yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah. Well, who were the players? You, you look at all the interviews. They were all the players that did uh, diverse training, diverse skill training. They explored different trajectories and different ways of hitting the end point of the ball. And they just, within two shots, could, could get the new flight of the ball. Well, you know, in training session, you should have different types of balls all the time. You know, not all the time, but, but you know, just to shake things up a bit. Um, so, yeah, your pathway really is, is getting that, mar it, it's, it's, it's marrying the bottom-up, top-down approach. Um, but I'd far rather do bottom-up and then have an end in mind. Like, your model is an end in mind, really, because you may have a, a style at your club that people believe in. But then you need to ask them, what is a style? And if you go to any club and ask them what it is, they can't tell you what it is. They'll just end up saying some principles of play or it will be based around a particular team that did really well one year and played in a certain way and that becomes our way. So you, you need to really dig deep in that and find out actually, no, 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 it could change next year because the age group at the under 12s and 14 show a lot of promise and potential which is slightly different. So is the system set up to accommodate that? <clears throat> and are the coaches talking to one another? Are, do you have coaches moving up through the pathway? 
and then drop back down again? Or, or do you have a lead and an assistant that keep rotating? And do you know so you can bring the best out of the capabilities of the players? So your system has to adapt to support the, the needs of the players. And um, <clears throat> so I'm not giving you any solution here, I guess. I'm, it's nothing you don't already aware of, I'm sure. But it's definitely something I think we need to talk about as a collective group within your, your club or your pathway <clears throat> and bring coaches in. You should have an international coach or a representative coach talking in the same group as an under 12 coach or a parent who wants to be a coach. That's how you break down those barriers. And what happens is they start to learn how to listen. You know, I'll listen to an under 12 B team coach and he'll actually have some things that he's seen that maybe the first team coach wasn't actually quite aware of. And they start to learn to respect each other's opinions. And so you need a diverse group. I wouldn't, and always have players in there. I mean, I'm doing a project here in Singapore as a director of sport for a school, a really, really massive school. Every meeting, there's no players in there. There's no students. So I had a heads of sport meeting. And the first meeting we had, had two students turn up and they shat themselves, heads of sport, senior PE teachers are like, what are our students doing in here? And I said, well, they're part of the system, aren't they? And the whole meeting changed. They wouldn't say certain things because we're not authentic. We're not sharing that information. So for me, always have change of players around. Let them be part of this. New Zealand's netball team now have got a under 18 school student on the New Zealand netball um, board, executive board, an under 19 year old girl on, a, on, the, on the world um, netball board. That's vision. Okay, you need to select them carefully, but it shows that we're actually listening and she can share that information and you can rotate them as well. So you're creating leaders, you know, creating lead, good leadership is creating leaders around you, you know, creating better people around you to support you and support themselves. So yeah, I think it's a really interesting area and you could dedicate a whole sort of hour, two hours on, on this particular topic coming up on the things you need to consider. Uh, and it's contextual as well. Everybody in this group today will have a slightly different context. Um, some may be more top down, others may be completely bottom up. And actually they have no model. They have a lack of clarity in where they're heading to, but, but they enjoy playing. So, you know, it's a, it's a, bit, of both, a bit of both, isn't it? Yeah. Thank you, Richard. And uh, it's funny, you talked about the um, putting the players in different conditions. I was with the Canadian men's national team for, uh, for two years before I moved to my club. And uh, we had a game in St. Kitts and Nevis. So very hot conditions. Um, we, we knew the pitch was going to be very poor. Yeah. But traditionally, the group would go to Florida in great conditions, great pitches, train, prepare, and then match day minus two arrive in, in St. Kitts and then play the game. But we said, no, we're going to go do our 10-day camp in St. Kitts, in the heat, on the bad pitch, and then, and then learn how to cope with the, with the situation. And, you know, it was definitely a much better – uh, performance and result in what we got in the past against St. Kitts. That's brilliant. And I like that. And I think, you know, the danger is, as you do something like that, just as to react. Do you remember I talked about that continuum? When we talk about variation, people then say, oh, I'm going to do a bit of variation now. And they do it one off or at a particular moment. And, and they're reacting to that. I think it's good to do that all the time as a, as a, as a tool. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. you may have a size five. Uh, what size balls do you normally have in football? Size five, is it? Or yes, size five, yeah. Size yeah. five, yeah. So you may have a subtly size four maybe that's very hard to detect and it's hidden in amongst the six balls, yeah? And so you get these subtle adjustments the whole time. Um, a futsal is heavier, so you've got to lift it more with your feet. So you, you create more upward motion and you use different parts of your feet. So you throw that in there every now and then, okay? So it, it, the, the, those changes are, should always be deliberate, um, but they're managed. It's not to the point of chaos. Never do you go too far into the chaos. You go to the, what I call the edge of chaos. Suddenly it becomes uncomfortable, but then they get used to it. And then you go back in again, yeah? So yeah, changing different surfaces, uh, different temperature, you know, coming up to this new World Cup in um, was Abu Dhabi or wherever it is. Um, yeah, you know, Qatar. yeah, Qatar, sorry. Yeah. You know, there's going to be adaptation there for sure. Um, 
and the, the best players have normally had a, a bit of a rough upbringing sometimes because they've had to find solutions. You know, they've had to find a way to win without someone telling them all the time. You do get gifted players, of course, that, that get the silver spoon right from the word go, you know, and they're still gifted. Of course they are. And, 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 but normally those players will, will always appreciate help and opportunities. They don't just take it for granted. So you've got to know your individuals in any team sport, you know, and, and don't hold their background against them. I think it's a, uh, and then some players like change and others don't. Some players want to be told, some don't. Um, so it's putting people on those continuums a little bit and treating them individually differently, not, not one model fits all. Yeah, definitely right. Thank you. Uh, thanks for those questions. I'm going to get uh, Jerson uh, here to ask a question. He's got one for you, Richard. Hey, Richard. Uh, just first and foremost, unreal presentation. Really enjoyed it and the conversation. So love to see that passion. Um, I have two questions, if you don't mind. I work at the university level in a, obviously performance um, environment. So I'm interested to, to learn where do you factor time into the, the skill acquisition of, uh, and, and performance? Um, how, how does time as a variable influence some of these methodologies and, and ways of working? Yeah. And then the, the second component was I'm really interested. I'm originally from Mexico, but I studied in Canada. And so I find it really interesting, your background and the context of understanding the context of where you're going, but also sometimes bringing a different way of doing things to elevate the players beyond what they might know. Mm -hmm. So if you want, if you, if you can speak maybe on, on both of those kind of pieces. Yeah, really, really good. Um, just just, just um, somebody mute. I think I'm, oh, that's better. Um, <clears throat> the first point, really good. And, and I think we probably need to talk more about the specific area of what you're interested in. But time and space are very key um, dimensions in sport, time and space. And obviously, that's football. Uh, football really, as a scientist, which I am, uh, and, a, and a coach, you would sort of say it's about, it's an interceptive task. It's moving to the right place at the right time, okay? And, and getting the ball into the right place at the right time. And that's space and time. We tend to train with space in mind all the time, like formations, systems, positioning, um, distance. Um, technique, skill. We're always really referring to space, how we move through space. And we, we largely neglect the, the, the temporal aspect, the timing aspect. And when you throw time in and you manipulate time, it, it's, 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 it, it plays with space. It, it, de it deconstructs your technique. So I think that's so important. What I learned very early on was manipulating time is a key role of a coach. Um, and I'm talking at two levels here. One is, is also how you plan sessions and methodology. That's at the system level, but then at the micro level. At the micro level, different layers, levels of, of analysis, but at the micro level, space and time is really important because um, uh, if, if you don't vary timing, what happens is they become very comfortable in the space dimension um, and your formation can deconstruct against a very good opposition. Your technique can be put under pressure. So your technique starts to crumble. Yeah. Uh, and that's skill. Basically you become less skillful because skill is time and space in a context. Um, so timing for me is, is critical, not only at the micro level. Um, and, and, you know, you could get a player to kick a ball 10 times into the goal, but he does it in his own time. And that's intrinsically timed. That's not skill, that's technique. Skill is extrinsically timed. It's timed off the world. It's timed off the context. And that's skill. So now you're manipulating time. And you may say to your player, I want you to kick it in the back of the goal. But you've got two seconds. One, two, go. And he's like, fuck, shit, get it in. And he missed. So the timing aspect is, 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 a, is embedded with space. You can't separate the two. The more you separate, the more problems you're going to have. 
So as a diverse universe, you have to keep space and time together. They don't exist in isolation. So with time in your training sessions, they are also linked with time at the collective um, system level. So if you talk about your pathway, you're talking about time and space over now 15 years or, or a journey through a university of, um, you mean a university university, not a school university, yeah? A school, how old? Yeah, university. So uh, I specifically work with uh, female players, 17 okay. to 21. Yeah. So for that age group, a lot of their behavior is already embedded by previous coaches and previous environments and cultures, as you well know, you know, and part of a good coach is you ask a lot of questions. Your parents get to know them, where have you come from? And you'll start to see certain players come from certain schools with a certain flavor about them. Yeah. Uh, and that's what we call the cluster, the clusters. You know, what, what, what sort of eco or niche in the environment are they coming from? And that's where you, as a, as a head coach for a region, you start to put these coaches out to create clusters for you. Mm -hmm. You know, in the, you, put, you implant them in the schools and you say creativity, I want, want a lot of this. But then if you get a lot of that, then you maybe get nobody technical who can control the ball. But they're all, you know what I mean? So you, you have to look at that very carefully. But effectively, time is, is probably the key constraint on anything it's the key constraint and it forces you to change your methodology under pressure mm -hmm. so if i went there and said look we're gonna we're about um uh play for all uh we're all inclusive yet suddenly on saturday the pressure comes and then uh suddenly we start to make changes in the last 20 minutes so we can win the game <laughs> what you're effectively saying is i never really believed in my principles <laughs> in the first place and I was bullshitting. Sorry about that. Um, uh, and, and that's what happens. So pressure is really the, the effect of time uh, and consequence, i.e. the outcome, the consequence. And if uh, that will pressure your space, i.e. your action and your behavior in that time. And that's where you change your mind. So really as a coach, be yourself. If you don't believe you're all inclusive, well tell your players. Listen, guys, this season, we really want to win games. That's what we're here for. But if you don't really want to be part of that, we do have a participation pathway. Or you can be part of the second team and the third team where the consequences of not winning doesn't matter. We want you to get better. So we're going to place more skill acquisition on the Bs and the Cs or, or, or the, the bigger squad underneath you. And you've got plenty of time to get better and get into your first team. And when they know that, your selection is based on those principles. So you make changes because people know that context and know the environment. Uh, and I think that's a massive part that your methodology needs to be underpinning your, your everything. And you need to, your players are a reflection of you. If you change your methodology at the last second and do something you said you never do, the players will do that eventually in the way they play, in the way they behave. And they'll go, oh, it doesn't matter. The coach didn't do it anyway, so we're not going to bother. So I'd, I'd be very strong on your principles and your values and your beliefs and have a system that supports that. It rewards that. Uh, in fact, you know, the girls should be quite happy to lose a game in the last 15 minutes if they knew that their friend was going to get a game. <laughs> and what they do is they'll change the way they play. So... In fact, if they fail and they lose that game, well, they've failed to adapt with that girl on the pitch. They should have changed what they did. So she becomes less of a consequence of mm -hmm. conceding goals. So there's always something to learn. And that's, they're the good coaches and they're the ones that we bring into our national pathways. And I'd call them high performance development coaches. It's a blend of development and high performance where we call them high performance development coaches. And it's no, no wonder the, the top coach for the All Blacks, Wayne Smith, he's a P teacher. He's a development coach, but he also understands high performance. Mm -hmm. So what we need is to recognize these development coaches as high performing. You can be a high performing under 16 coach. It doesn't mean you have to win everything. It means that you are actually developing people who've got potential to be high performers. Mm -hmm. But he's manufacturing it to actually have a lot of losses because the more losses, the, the, if you get the right losses, you, you get the right reflective feedback and you learn if you create that environment. So you have to actually plan what I call the rocky road. You've got to plan that some games are going to be tough and that 
you're going to see how that they find a way and you give them enough techniques and tools to solve problems, but you guide them. You're not there to tell them how to solve that problem necessarily. You may do it a high performing team. So if the consequences are quite high, you need to win a game. The players feel like they really want to test out everything they've learned. And this is a game to really gauge their improvement. Then yeah, so be it. Um, but that should still really come from the players and your role as a coach. You have to determine what that is in the philosophy of your club. But for me personally, it's to support the decision-making of the player. And I will tell them something if we have got very little time and the players can't pick up that information. So maybe you've got two minutes and the players didn't see something and you may tell them something like, oh, the ref said this, or by the way, the opposition are changing what they're doing. And then you give that information to your players, you know, definitely, because they can adapt off that. Um, but yeah, just definitely timing is, is key. Um, what was the second point, sorry? Uh, the context. How do you balance context of the environment that you're going into with your own upbringing and, and I guess creating the best way of growth or the most maybe strength, yeah. the strongest growth? Yeah, well, the context is... Um, it's very dynamic and I think it's, it's, it's a mix of different things. Um, so when we do a training session, uh, our coaches will always talk about three things at the end of the session when they do the review, context, task, and the variation. So under those three things, you have everything. So the task, um, was it appropriate? I.e., you know, uh, we've got this game based session. We're focusing on these, uh, themes. Um, <clears throat> did the players, um, perform the task that, that was needed to, to be able to improve. Uh, and you look at that and you analyze that and you also look at the variation of that. And the variation was maybe it wasn't representing the game enough. It didn't, it didn't feel like the game or we didn't design it in a way as such where we change things to increase the problem. They call it challenge point. So the challenge didn't meet the, the needs of the players. It needs to be challenging enough that it doesn't work. And when it doesn't work, they try to adapt something. If it works, they don't change. They don't learn. They don't adapt. They're just doing, they're just executing. And execution isn't development. It's, it's just, it's a point in time where somebody does something and it works. So that's fine, but that's not the role of practice. So you actually have to get the challenge right for them where they have to adapt that. So <clears throat> when you do all of those things, you end up with a context that suits the the need for that skill the skill is a solution to a problem and it needs to suit the contextual problem and if it does you get massive improvements in performance okay it may not happen there and then but it, it's the it's the making of that improving of performance they're rejigging they're rechanging things uh, i call it a learning pit in every session you need a learning pit where the learning goes down and then it goes back up again as it goes down, <clears throat> we call it the well, like the water well. <clears throat> You're in the learning pit. Uh, and that's where learning takes place. And you've got to help the player get out of that, that pit, the learning well. And when they get out of it, they get confidence. They've adapted something. They've adapted their skills or their techniques. And they get resilience. <clears throat> they get confidence and competence. And that's how you develop resilience. It isn't inside the classroom. It isn't in a workshop. It isn't with a sports psych sitting in there going through some sort of model. It's by placing players in problems where they have to continually try to get out of these problem areas using those techniques. <clears throat> and then what you do is you, you support them getting out of that. It could be anything, coaching on the run, feedback, giving, developing awareness, guiding them. Uh, and that context is constantly changing, but it's based on the needs of the player. So if that context suits the, the skill needs, you get this match. And what happens is if you've trained skill and your team and the context changes, they're going to play with, and that's the scenario I gave you um, to read. If you read that, it's about an English player who gets abused by the coach. For, for training in a certain way and doing what he was trained to do, but the Dutch read what was going on, set a trap, took the ball off him and scored. So we, we have got that going on everywhere right now because the context didn't suit the skill. We're setting the skill up for a context that we believe is going to happen or we believe is really important. So <clears throat> you've got to do that to a degree in your training, of course. <clears throat> 
and that's where you get the repetition where you you condition <clears throat> or constrain certain con contexts so it becomes slightly more predictable what's going to happen so then therefore you can focus more on what your skill is and your action that you're going to do yeah um, but you don't go there for too long um, and and you get a lot of confidence there which is great uh, it looks good <clears throat> but you need to you need to keep that honest as well so um, the context is key so yeah the context is the interaction of the task um, the players and the environment those three things need to interact to create the right context um, and I'd always get feedback from the players too <clears throat> on how you thought the they you know they interacted a lot of players will say it's totally unrealistic I would never have that many options <laughs> or actually that's really good it it's just like the game. It's suddenly I, in the game where I have to make a decision and play back or to the side. This, this, is, this reflects what I have to do, this training session. So <clears throat> you basically design with the player the context uh, to suit the needs that they need to train. <clears throat> and I think that's really, really important. It's a good skill to have with your players to do that. Um, obviously, they're not all that skillful, but I'd say at a university level, um, you know, these players are smart. Some players are very smart. They're not high IQ, but they're game smart. They're game intelligent. So I think that's a key skill. I would highlight that as a skill. Normally they'll say passing, heading, whatever, whatever, but it's actually, you know, tactical intelligence of the game. Game intelligence is, is a key skill very early on. And they may only be able to answer a question by moving on the pitch. They can't answer it verbally. It doesn't matter. You know that they can do it, so you don't have to ask them. Just say, show me. You know, I'm hearing it, but I'm not seeing it. So, you know, the acid test of learning is seeing. It's not hearing. You know, you can tell me you could be the world's best player. You give me all the right answers, and you know all the tactical solutions, but you're not moving and regulating your movements based on that information. So what we do is we cut down the amount of off-pitch time. The classroom is the pitch. And if you need to go to a sub classroom, like a video room or anything outside, then you've got to deserve, deserve that. You've got to earn the right to do anything off the pitch because it takes people time. It takes resources, you know? Um, so yeah, I think that's a really key thing. And that, that's part of the context as well. So when you go off the pitch, it's not a true context. So what you do is you make it real quick take information and then put it back into the real context and say, right, what cues or what information are we looking for now? And what happens is they tend to drive the sessions. We'll go from a video room to make sure that their next session improves because of what they did in that video room. There must be transfer, otherwise don't do it. Just, just get rid of all those sessions and say, solve it on the, on the pitch. And um, yeah, so the context and the language needs to support that as well. Your terminology, the way you speak to players, the way you interact and where you address them has to support that yeah you know you can't sort of say look we're about here being creative and trying to learn and adapt something and then two minutes later you're having a go at a player for doing something and making the wrong choice it totally totally ruins that environment and, and that trust so your terminology and the way you interact must must suit that as well sorry fabio i'm just aware of time no you know what richard uh <clears throat> I like again million thank yous. This is this is me in a nutshell. I'm loving everything about this. Honestly, I know everybody is. I, I'm, I'm I, I rarely look at my phone, but it's going off the hook here. So people are hearing about it from other people already and asking for recordings of this. And I mean, it, it would be an injustice to not to share this, but at the same time, not have you back on. Honestly, if we could. I know, again, like just the people that are on here, there's, there, here you go, people are already asking for the next one. Multiple questions still coming up. Um, <clears throat> I'm just talking a little bit in my throat is uh, <clears throat> getting a little rusty. So you, you've gone through three hours of talking. Uh, I appreciate all the time you've taken with us here this, this morning for yourself, uh, for everybody. I know we enjoyed it thoroughly. Um, a million thank yous. Um, we look forward to having you back on again. We will interact. And I think what is interesting, and I'll put this out to everybody that's been on the show, is that maybe this could, you know, lead up to another conversation uh, via email or like Yanni said on Twitter. And then we could, you know, really prepare ourselves to come back into a conversation with yourself because 
I'm just, like I said, I don't even know what questions to ask here because we could go a million different ways. And I think you've, you've managed to answer all the ones that have come in, um, you know, so enlightening. Uh, and the key word for me is so inspiring. Um, I know a lot of people uh, like to like to think uh, this way and, 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 you know, you just remind us that th there's so much opportunity in the game and to really just believe in the players. And I know that this coaches for coaches format is exactly that. We believe in each other as coaches. Uh, we do believe in the player and our methodology um, is it, always uh, about the player and, and making them the focal point of each and every session. I, I could hear it when you're talking that everything comes back to the player and uh, like, uh, I'm just so thankful and so grateful that you were able to share what you shared with us this uh, morning, this evening for us, and uh, look forward to having you back on again. Thanks. It means a lot that. Thanks for the kind words and everybody taking time. Like, I know a lot of people have had to go, but for hanging around for three hours, it's, it's, I know we haven't interacted with everybody, but those questions have been superb. And I'm sure you've taken some things away, and I'm more than happy to continue any form of individual interaction through Fabio or um, come back again and touch on a specific area, very much dependent on, on you guys, uh, how you want to take that. So more than happy, you know, and, and I'm sure some great things are going on over there and I'd love to learn as well. I, I didn't, you know, I've, I've got to ask questions to learn. So it'd be nice to have more interaction next time we go around. So thanks for that, it's been great. We look forward to that. Then again, to Yanni's Joey, and Mike, thank you so much for helping out with today's show.